Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome back. We'd like to thank the presence of all of you here at the second day of the international seminar of public security, human rights and democracy. So following up with the topic, we have security of borders and defense of sovereignty, the threat of criminal organizations. I'd like to invite to the stage the Minister of Defense, Mr. José Múcio Monteiro. You're welcome, Minister José Múcio Monteiro, who was the Secretary of uh, Foreign Affairs and Ministry of the, the Accounting of the Union. He was former minister, federal deputy for Pernambuco, a minister of institutional relations. Also, former minister, uh, Mr. General Tomás Beiro, general and commander of the Brazilian army. He was a head of the AMAN the School of the Army and Chief of Education Culture of the Army and Commander of the Southeast, Southwest, sorry. And also, um, General Fernando Azevedo de Silva. Welcome, General. He's General of the Brazilian Army. He was uh, in front of the East commander. He was chief of the army and a special advisor of the Supreme Court in 2018. So with you, General Silvia. Good morning to everyone, those who are here present and those who are online. I'm very pleased to be here between the Minister of Defense, Minister Musio, and the Commander of the Army, uh, General Tomas. The topic proposed to us, border security. This is the main topic for us. Defense of sovereignty also is a theme uh, posed to us. And the threat of criminal organizations, you can see on top, there is a public security, human rights, and democracy. I'd like to start with the introduction, Mr. Musio, about this topic, democracy. Yesterday, we had an event which was very meaningful. Uh, it was the 80th anniversary of the D-Day in Lombardia, the overload operation on the 6th until 11 months later, the world was freed from the Nazi fascism. So we had also an emblematic participation of uh, Brazilians they said that it would be very hard to send troops over there, but we were able to do it. So I'd like to bring this acknowledgement about our democracy. So not to waste your time, I'd like to uh, give you the words followed by the general. So the floor is yours. I would like to greet you all, Minister of Defense, Fernando Vivedo, Mr. Tomás, also Mr. Vard, the coordinator of the public security, Benedito Mariano, and the director for the Institute for Reform of the State, 
Mr. Hav Valin would like to greet uh, old friend Jose Girceu, who is here today, and my colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, are going to read some data. That's a lot of numbers, so we, before we can talk with more formalities. And I'll say I'm sorry, because yesterday we were in another commitment. Both the general and I were surprised by an invitation by our boss, the president, that we would that we'd go to the south of Brazil to have a sequence on the work that we are developing there. To understand better the challenges we face in the Ministry of Defense, we need to understand the dimensions of our country. Brazil has the fifth largest land area. It's about 4,500 kilometers from the south to the north and similar from the east to the west. We could fit all of the West Europe inside. We have a large extension of land together with the Amazon, 16,000 kilometers of uh, borders with the other countries of South America. It's about 17,000 kilometers of borders, limits with 10 countries and 22 square meters of aerial. Moreover, we are one of the top 10 global economies to defend all this, pa this patrimony. We need strong forces. We have a lack of information regarding the, the, the work that the army is doing in a country as ours, where inequality is very deep, as well as the access of opportunities. We understand that knowledge is the key for the building up of a more just and productive country. Brazil have challenges which are related to uh, security than defense in itself. But this is an aspect that uh, we face in the army with uh, criminal, criminal organizations, crime and, uh, environmental and human and drug trafficking, between others. To have internal security and international, we have applied resources in different ways, and together with uh, strategic planning synergy of its people. We have the Agatha operation, Yanomami, and others as an example, and other situations where combined actions are applied to have uh, effective measures to protect the borders. The ag operation uh, is a pre preventive and repressive action in the borders. We have logistic and intelligence operations, always together with incorporation with public organizations and our governmental organizations. In the digital areas, like in the Yanomami, we apply people and resources to complement the works of the government, especially the healthcare and crisis as energy and transport in areas of difficult access and other problems. These are the government projects in which we try to achieve the goals established. The law, which was launched in 2023, brought a combined effort for the three forces with a deep impact for the national security and the control of the, the country, especially in the seaside. With that, the Marine were able to guarantee the law and order in port in border areas. We have the Agatha West Frontier 2 with LGO for port and airports. 
a inspeção naval, o patrulhamento marítimo. Uh, the Marine did inspections and surveillance in the Rio de Janeiro port in Taguaí, near the the lake. We have patrolled and checked people and cars with extensive surveillance inland and aerial. In 2024, it was made over 700 intelligence operations with about 2,100 military people. 136 autos de prisão em flagrante, apreensão de drogas, embarcações, veículos e aeronaves, além de grande quantidade de armas e munições. No total, foram apreendidos quase 200 mil itens de contrabando. No contexto da segurança das fronteiras, tão importante ação do Estado para a segurança interna e combate ao crime organizado, o país dispõe do sistema integrado de monitoramento de fronteiras, o CIFROM, e do Exército Brasileiro. Desenvolvidos nove, as nove fases, o CIFROM. The CIFROM was developed in nine different phases. It has its own infrastructure and resources. We conduct in, we have a support system to support logistics decisions with effective information for the army to keep these means, personnel, equipment, and resources for monitoring and controlling our borders. We have overcome challenges in the past. We have the potential to integrate and collaborate. We have the political will and the ability to grow and live in peace. Therefore, we expect Brazil and its neighbors to have relationships in the future in an environment with more harmony, fraternity, work, and development. We are aware and confident. We are at peace. We have justice in our centers and the cities in uh, the interior. They all depend on the actions carried out in the borders. In our seaports and airports, we work diligently. The federal government is aware of this challenge and does everything that is viable to ensure that our border is more stable and safer. Thank you. Before I pass the floor, I would like to mention Mr. Valfredo Varde, who is spearheading this whole thing. And our colleague, Senator Katia, thank you. Mr. Dirceu, who's here. And I now will pass the floor to the commander of the army. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm... Uh, I'm uh, very grateful to be here with so many authorities. I'd like to mention some of the uh, occurrences that have happened recently. Just to let you know, today we have 72 operations underway in the Brazilian territory. They range from humanitarian operations to the Takari operation in Rio Grande do Sul, where they had the flood and the patrimonio in the Northeast, the PIPA operation to distribute drinking water. But on the specific topic of border control, the army has a constitutional duty. It is set forth in law number 97 of 1999, and it sets forth that it falls to the armed forces, not just the army, to uphold the specific authorities of judicial police. And we have no doubt that judicial police do have the primary authority, but the armed forces are also tasked with protecting the borders, including by patrol, by uh, inspecting people, sea craft and aircraft. 
Article 17a, it falls to the army to cooperate with the federal agencies in the form of logistic support, communication, and integration. Now, this is a permanent authority. This does not require any kind of extraordinary order. This is set forth in the law. So following what the minister said, in the 17,000 kilometers of border, this is much bigger than the border between the US and Mexico, which is only 3,000 kilometers. So General Fernandez, to paraphrase your your words, uh, June 6th, we had D-Day. Now on the 10th, we have Artillery Day with the birth of Marechal Malay, who is the patron of Brazilian artillery. And he was truly a patriot, even though he was born abroad. He was active in the Paraguay War here in Brazil. And he's famous because he opened a ditch that prevented enemy forces to invade our territory and destroy our artillery. So there's a, a quote. He said, they cannot pass. Imagine how simple it would be to dig a ditch in certain borders to prevent all sorts of illegal and negative elements to come into our society. It doesn't work that way because all the good elements also cross the border. All of our wealth, the people we want to allow into our country pass through our borders. So it's a, it's a paradox. And why is the army involved? Well. The army is involved because the army has permanent platforms near the border regions. People often don't know there are 77 military organizations in the border regions from the furthest south to the furthest north of our border. So all around Brazil, at some point, there's going to be a military institution. And if you have the privilege of knowing what our actions are like near the borders, you will often find in certain locations only a single army uh, battalion, such as in Cucu or in Aguariz, Aguarete, or Tului, Paricachoeira. All of these regions have nothing at all other than a army battalion where a lieutenant lives with his family and with his soldiers. They often live there for a year in difficult conditions even it's difficult to receive supplies. There's no river in Cucu. They can only get there by small aircraft. And that is the center of an important operation occurring now, which is the Katramani operation, which exists to preserve our borders from illegal mining, which does occur, and to protect the indigenous peoples who live in our territory. This is Yanomami land where the Kuku operation is located. So we have the coordination of these two different actions and to work in the border regions. Our main project, as the Ministry of Defense mentioned, is the integrated border monitoring system, which essentially comprises three activities. One is sensors. We need technology in the border regions. And since we have this platform, we can maintain technology, radars, and different thermal imaging equipment. All of these technological innovations, drones, we are currently implementing drones. So all of these devices are employed there and kept there by whomever, because it is an interagency task force that that works in the borders. The Federal Revenue Service, the Federal Police, the environmental entities, the indigenous protection entities, all of these actions need to work in synergy, but the platforms work through the system, the integrated system that we have. Now, the problem is that the border system, CISPRON, which was scheduled to conclude in 2021, it actually extended as a result of budget concerns up to 2035 or 2039. So actually only 21% have been fully complete. 
but we need to move forward because what happens with this project is that when the technology arrives, if it takes too long, sometimes it becomes obsolete. Sometimes it is just uh, uh, lost because of time, because organized crime in general, they are asymmetric. They don't have management control. They spend money. So they seek the same technologies that we do, thermal imaging, better communication equipment, equipment that can detect whether we are listening in on them. So the border monitoring system works on three pillars, sensors, decision support, and actions. Without any of these pillars, we will not be able to effectively protect our borders. Our actions, as a rule, depend essentially on aerial vectors, that is helicopters, because helicopters can be employed by any entity, any protection entity, whether that's the federal police or the public security or the Brazilian army within the border regions. So anyone can use them, but it doesn't matter who takes action. What is important is for the action to occur, for the protection to occur quickly. And all crimes that occur in the border regions are essentially the same when it comes to protect, uh, to, to uh, policing them, whether that is smuggling weapons or drugs or harming the indigenous peoples or harming the environment. We must strengthen the technological efficiency in our border regions. We need to work quickly and effectively. So essentially, that is what I wanted to bring up here and talk about how the army works in the border regions. Now, as for results, when we receive funds, the results do happen. So now in the Agatha operation in the western border, we were working at the core of the problem in the trans-border crime division. Of course, it's a joint project with many other agencies. We had 400 million in seizures with 40 million in investment. So it's a very large investment, very large return. So if we, if our investment allowed a friendly nation to conduct a mirrored operation, then that is even doubly effective. Because when we talk about border regions, we must talk about cooperation with other countries. And they live in certain circumstances. Part of their populations live off of time. And so that often becomes difficult unless we have coordinated actions. So that's what we need to implement and to uh, to 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 live up to our responsibility. Thank you. Wow, uh, Minister, thank you. I, uh, I I don't even really know how to reply. We're out of time too, but I just want to make a comment. Brazilian society is not very much aware of what happens to the army because first they say that the head of the armed forces is the president. That means that whoever is leading the president's office is the head of the armed forces. Now, removing the politi uh, politicization, that is the political bent of the armed forces is crucial. Secondly, if we consider what we have, what our potential is, what our wealth is, explored or unexplored, Brazil is a vastly wealthy country. And our armed forces are not compatible with the size of our country. Our armed forces are minimal. Everything the general mentioned here, and I felt compelled to answer, especially with the Cifron system, when we have the funds, to up to to complete the Cifron, it's going to be out of date. Now, I must mention that President Lula is very responsible with regard to investments in the armed forces. 
he created the Gripen aircraft, the frigates that are being built, the submarine issue. But over the past 10 years, we have seen a drop in our investment, a 47% drop in investment. That's 47% less than in the past. Now, since we do not have financial predictability, we cannot schedule absolutely anything at all. We recently had an ambassador from a friendly nation who was angry, saying that we needed to buy some equipment. And he got angry and anger. And when it got to my turn to speak, I said, listen, I can't buy you. I can't buy anything from you. And you're angry. Imagine how angry you would be when I can't pay. If you're so angry. Imagine how angry you'll be when it comes time to bill me. But we we have no predictability. Now, NATO requires 2% of the GDP from every NATO country to be directed to their armed forces. The UK thought it was too low. They increased it to 3.5. Now, we are at 1.1% without predictability. So those who are in charge are those who uh, do the budgeting. So you have to be able to do it. We got, we arrived from the Congress the other day, one of the deputies said, why should we have um, army forces if you don't have wars? And I disguised and say, we have wars every day. We have a huge war in the south of Brazil uh, for the floods in the Amazon. Uh, we have the indigenous areas. We have wars with our borders because of dr drug trafficking. The only thing they do is to work and they're all busy and we have to be proud of what the army forces are. And I will say more. Another thing that I have to say, if we owe the, the coup of 1964 to the army, we owe the army for not having a, not a coup in 2023. We are completely aware of what we needed to do for the democracy in that year. And why am I saying this? Because yesterday we talked with our colleagues, our, the, uh, the Chile, the country, has the Cooper fund. So when are we are going to going to buy a car? They ask, what's your uh, monthly income? We don't have it. So we don't sometimes have money for, for paying our bills. We bought the first aircraft of GRIPS and this deal was postponed for so many times that now we need to buy uh, um, spare parts for the first aircraft. So we cannot say that we bought the, co the airplanes, the aircrafts. Each time that we don't pay, the deliver is uh, postponed. This is serious, and it's not about. It's not for the com the government in power to deal with it. It has to be considered for all governments. We have to have this money. Another example from the 80s to here: 50 percent of the uh, navy fruit. Uh, it was retired and, and, and it's, it's continuing. If things goes like this, we're gonna have um, people working in the Navy, but we're not gonna have equipment. So we have to take this matter seriously because army forces that we have, we have excellent people trained and disciplined. It's one of the best schools that I have ever seen, but we have, we do not have equipment. We have, let's say, great musicians, but our instruments are just too old. So we have to take this into this matter very seriously regarding, regardless of government parties, we need to follow the constitution, which is an institution, uh, army is an institution of the Brazilian state. That's the comment I wanted to say. Okay, great. So I think that I can finish. I'd like to talk a little bit about the regulamentation that is we ex exist with for the army in the in the borders. I'm going to mention a few things and we'll say. 
a provoca provoking. The first thing about the borders, what is the borders? The first place, time we heard in a law, it was 69. And then we have the 88 constitution with three articles in the constitution that says directly or indirectly of, of the borders. The article 20, the 91 and article 142, which is the main one. Am I right, Thomas, regarding the forces? To regulate this, we had another law, the 97, which put together the preparation and the appliance of these forces. And then in 2004, uh, we had another one which was very important, the complementary law, which established the preventive action and repressive action of the Brazilian army. It doesn't mention the Navy and the Air Forces. So it established as it was a LGO, which is permanent to the army and minister. Another complementary law extended the possibility of acting in this uh, border area for the army and the Navy and the Air Force. So the regu regulation of the action of the forces is established. I'd like to check if there's any difficulty to act there in these areas. Next, there is the defense national policy, the strategy, a white book for the defense. That's what I was going to say. Well, you are you are talking for me, which was the latest version, which was approved recently. At the second chapter, it established as a priority for the fourth three areas of acting. The first one is Amazon, the the blue Amazon, which is the South Atlantic and the border areas. So that includes many operations like the Agatha operation from there, which involves regulation, uh, bigger activities. And you know this because you were in the Congress for many years. Uh, to be more engaged with the, with the legislative, not to apply only the strategies and policies, but also the budgeting. We see that relating, they should be on since 2021, but in this big pack of regulation, national strategy plan, budgeting, and so on, I'd like you to complement with uh, some other information. This regulatory issue, the framework, I believe it's well established. I don't feel any difficulty. Sometimes it's not from our of our knowledge or and not from the many people. Now in the appliance and the operation, for example, in Roraima State, when we have this coincidence of a operation that would need to be repressed, perceived, and it, it became repressive because of lodging. So it was determined uh, an area together with a logistic humanitarian operation so we could save those people that were in an emergency of, for food. So I believe that at that point we were in doubt if we needed to apply any other extraordinary measure or guarantee of law and order and we didn't need it because in all that area of border we are allowed to act the army force the brazilian army could establish a commander together and establish an, an area an action like agatha so we could act but to make it permanent they are expensive and then we come into the budgeting problem. So uh, having resources and applying resources would be 
it should be taken into consideration seriously because these operations are not continuous. The thing is, we should not have like um, specific actions. Sometimes those specific actions, we have a great result at first, but what happens after that? How do we maintain it? It's not there all the time to to have it permanent all the time. It means to increase the resources that we we need, like uh, surveillance, techn techn technology, people. So we have to think in a constellation of smaller satellites to be surveilling the areas so we can prevent that the risk comes back too quickly, which usually happens in those areas. Because those areas are huge. For example, if you think about the Yanomami indigenous territory, we're talking about an area like the, the size of Portugal. So we spoke to the minister and it was very hard. We went there with the minister and it was very hard to get there because of the clouds. It took about four and a half hours to go around all the territory. And it was very hard. It was very hard to act in these areas. They are very large and it demands a lot of resources. So this is one of our challenges. That's why technology is so important in order to cover such large and strategic areas for all the Brazil. This topic of those first first laws, the 150,000 kilometers of borders, we wanted to extend another 100 kilometers. So we could have uh, 250 kilometers of um, border areas. But after studying for a year or more, we just understood that it's, it's completely difficult to amplify this another 100,000 kilometers because Firstly, uh, constitutionally, it was hard. There are some things that should be done. For example, those areas should not have industry, um, mine exploration, airport. There's just so many things that it makes impossible, especially in these areas in the central part of the Brazil and the south, where the, the development is already established. Therefore, we came to the conclusion that we need many, many different laws there. And we were going to present two proposals. One um, proposal from a senator, I don't remember the name, is to reduce the area, and another one from a deputy to reduce this border area. So we believe that the best thing we can do is to do it well, according to what is established in the Constitution. We have a big difficulty to work in the Amazon. We, I call it uh, dry ice because once you try it, uh, it soon is wet again. When you get to Roraima, when you get there in Rio de Janeiro, you see the Christ the Redeemer. When you get the, to Roraima, you have mining there. Yeah, so we have the mining, the illegal mining there. That is sometimes if you walk in there, you kick a rock and then find some gold. And once you remove these illegal extraction extractors, you will see the Yonomami, but you don't meet the old ones. You get the young Yonomami. They receive 4,200,000 uh to work in this uh, legal mining. 4,000. 200 and an old lady that it was the the owner and or the leader of um, an organ, organization there she said to go through the river with a, a boat you had to pay two thousand reais per boat so if there is 20 kind of uh, boats so they they earn 40,000 reais. So once you clean that area, you do the operation and you clean it up. But then when we leave, all that comes back. So what's the biggest challenge? We have money in the 
public and private sector. The private is forbidden at indigenous areas. A mineral ex extracted according to the law that pays taxes is explored by criminals. So there's a, a decision we need to take. We need a lot of resource to be spent in an area we would not, which will not be profitable. But the organized crime is being established in the Amazon in areas that cannot, cannot do planting of trees. So it's really, really hard because the law doesn't protect us. We are looking into a territory where we can establish that the private uh, public countries, but private companies could help us with it. For example, in Las Vegas, the area is from the indigenous people. New Zealand, New Zealand also is indigenous. Canada, Australia, this model works in the world. They left, they put the criminals aside and put the population to take care of the indigenous areas. They would receive so much more and the areas would be preserved. And why am I saying that? Because the challenges are permanent. We need to put resources, as Mr. General Thomas said, we start and, but when we leave, everything comes back. So these forces are willing to make it work. The president of the, the president also. The knowledge that everyone needs to have about this reality is going to bring us closer to a uh, final result, final solution. Thank you. I want to make a few comments about organized crime that goes through the border zones. We see news all the time about organized crime with heavy weaponry, carrying huge amount of, of drugs through the main city centers. And part of the media tasks that to the vulnerability of our borders, the arrival of weapons, the arrival of drugs. So I'd like to ask those of you who have experience, what is missing in addition to what you mentioned here? This is all a result of the border zones of the 17,000 kilometers of our border, the permeability of our border. What would we have from the experience that the Air Force have with regard to that? What could we add to fighting crimes? And of course, not all, but part of that does come from the border zones or through the border zones. Minister, I'd like to uh, begin with, uh, with General Thomas. Thank you. I think the first thing that sense is intelligence. We need a lot more intelligence and we need to understand that working on border zones is uh, about synergy. It does, it, it requires the Brazilian state to be involved, all the institutions, because we're not just talking about the border zones, we're also talking about seaports, airports, and the creativity and asymmetry is enormous. We are talking about extensive resources and solutions that are increasingly more creative. For instance, when we talk about illegal mining, we have an operation at the source of the Purue River, which is a tributary of the Japura River. It is a navigable river that comes from Colombia. And there was a huge establishment of, uh, of equipment by the agencies, by the IBAMA and ICMBO agencies. So, when mining ends, international trafficking begins. There are locations where the 
trafficking is done by small aircraft that fly very low to the ground. So then we're saying, oh, this operation is not predominantly military. Okay, but we use tactical practices and procedures that are very similar because we need to detect a low-flying aircraft, which is pretty much a staple of anti-air artillery. We need to identify the location where they dump their cargo or where they land, and that requires a public agent, whether that's a civil or a federal police, to engage there because you need intelligence to see where that cargo is being dumped. So it's a permanent action, an effective action that needs to occur. And we need to constantly strive to follow the tracks of the criminals so that we can be effective. So without that synergy, we are not going to be successful. And where do we see the main problems? In the major city centers where crime is out of control. I think that's... Uh, that's that's the road without systemic cooperation and there are good uh, good efforts there but sometimes we see that the means are not effective and often the the staff are ineffective the manpower is ineffective and that's why we need monitoring systems in the borders we need to employ the army platforms that are already there that's why we need everyone to be present we cannot lose a single person Sometimes I have the feeling that we are much more interested in investing in protecting our borders than our neighbors are. Partnerships are not easy to come by. The whole world is arming itself. Last year, $2.24 trillion were spent. Japan, their constitution forbade them to invest in defense. And now all of a sudden, Japan is investing heavily in defense. Portugal is a peaceful nation. They were never involved in any war other than as a location for dialogue. Suddenly, they decided to arm themselves. The US goes without saying, Europe lives in conflict. Everyone is defending themselves. The world is in conflict. And here, we do not have strong armed forces in South America. These investments in the border zones are pretty much done only by Brazil. The other countries don't invest because we don't have conflict. We don't have issues with our neighbors. Sometimes there is an ideological issue that arises, but passes quickly. We don't have any serious conflicts with our neighbors. But recently, we had in Paraguay, Paraguay has 20,000 men. The Sao Paulo police has 98,000 men. So the scales are completely different. We can't even establish partnerships. In other words, we are the ones who need to take care of ourselves, not just to prevent crime that comes from abroad. And initially I said that we don't really have a lot of relationship with public security, but in our seminar, this is about public security. So how can we fix Rio de Janeiro? To be honest, how can we start? Where do we change things? Because in a year that has gone by, of the seven counselors, six have been arrested. So our challenges are permanent because we have been postponing many problems. We haven't resolved them. We haven't tackled them. There is... Uh, um, there is a, 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 a an evil cooperation between these agents. They, there is a conspiracy between these agents. It, there's a quote that says that in a series I recently saw, of all the major crimes that occurred, no one was arrested, including with known actors. No one was held responsible. So everything is always under investigation. Nothing is ever completed. And we are becoming a country that is not safe for regular citizens. The armed forces are constantly 
in their headquarters through GLOs. They are summoned. Oh, if you establish a GLO, there's a risk of a military coup. Well, uh, military coups don't need laws. There's no rules for for coups. So that fear makes us postpone our solutions and our problems become ripe, they consolidate, and in short, we are encouraging crime. I would like to add to what the minister said about the indigenous lands and mining. I'm, as it happens, I, I know a little bit about that. The constitution sets forth that mining in indigenous lands must be regulated by law. This is established in the Constitution of 1988. The first attempt had, was in a bill by Senator Romero. Senator, you know that. That was in 1995. The bill was passed in the Senate. It went to the chamber. A special commission was appointed and it still persists to this day. They're still debating. That's all I need to say about that. Minister, Commander, we are near the end of our time. Thank God, because I don't have any more questions, but I will pass the floor to you. I'd just like to say that I also came here to celebrate a very important date that very few Brazilians are aware of. Monday, June 10th, the Ministry of Defense celebrates 25 years. I want to pay tribute to President Fernando Henrique Cardoso, who created the Ministry of Defense. The Ministry of Defense is still in the process of being formed. Thank God willing, in July, we will create the beginning of the civil career in the Ministry of Defense. That means people can go to school for and study defense we will create civilian defense professionals because today they are all military. And we will create, we will educate military scientists, defense scientists, just like many other countries. So this is a huge leap forward. And that's why I wanted to share that news with you. You are responsible Brazilians who love your country. And we're very happy to announce that we have celebrated our 25th anniversary, but there's still a lot to do. I don't know why. I, I know that date too. I, I'll i be there. I'll be there at the table. We were going to organize some celebrations, but in respect for the people of Rio Grande do Sul, we suspended everything. We're only going to host some religious ceremonies to thank God. I'd also like to take this opportunity to say that in these 25 years, I was present at a modest capacity next to President Fernando Enrique when he created the Ministry of Defense. And we had a time of complete harmony at the, under the leadership of our minister. He, he is very dear to all of us. We're all very fond of him. The space that we have is a space of growth, of enormous growth in the interoperability. This issue is essential for us. It is not possible to have any kind of operation in the world that is not a joint operation. And it needs to be joint and based on reality. So interagency operations are a global trend. Conflicts are showing this. We have increasingly tried to be more tempered, more balanced, more legitimate, which is essential for employing the armed forces. After all, the armed forces are the strong arm of the state, and this is essential for us to take action. And moderation as well. You see that in the modern world, we can't have the exaggeration because we saw 80 years ago what we celebrated today. Would, would this happen today? Would humanity tolerate 
conflicts as intense with so many victims with so many side effects and when we say side effects we're talking about civilian population so this question becomes more and more important so the ministry of defense is a reality that has been consolidated and it falls to us to improve more and more so that our efficiency even with scarce resources we can live up to the challenges that brazil faces today Lastly, I would like to pay a tribute to Commanders General Tomás Ocean at, uh, in the uh, Navy and in the Air Force as well, and uh, Damasceno. I'd like to thank the IDP. I'd like to thank the IREE for inviting us. It was an honor taking part in this event. Thank you. Just to conclude, as mediator appointed by Valfredo, I would like to thank you profusely, Minister, and also uh, Commander Tomas. And we didn't have a lot of time, but it was very, uh, it was very, very profitable, very, very. Uh, it was a very prolific time, so I'd like to ask for a big round of applause, please. Muito, muito. Oi, oi, oi. Muito obrigada pelas contribuições. Thank you very much for the contribution. Now we're gonna take the official picture. Let's continue with our seminar, the second day of seminar. Now we're going to debate a panel called Structural Racism and Judiciary. I invite to the stage our Honorable Judge of the São Paulo City Court of Appeals, Mr. Luiz Guilherme da Costa Wagner. Luis Guilherme da Costa Wagner, Wagner is graduated in law, master in urban law and processual law from PUC at São Paulo. In 2015, it entered uh, the court in São Paulo, also uh, as a moderator um, of this panel have Mr. Marcos Rezende. Marcos Rezende is vice president of IREE in Brasilia, historian and master of patrimonies, a founder of the Black Entities Collectives. I'll pass the word to Mr. Rezende. Have a good panel. Good afternoon to all and all people here present. This is a very special moment of our meeting of the my colleague, because we from Iris, when we thought about this seminar, we wanted to discuss public security, human rights, and democracy in all levels and reaching all levels of society. So initially, I would like to thank Alfredo Vargas, which is the president of the Institute for this event that brought together dozens of ministers and, and over a hundred of specialists from around the world and also yourself. I would like to start posing a question regarding the topic of structural racism and the judicial of this process of quotas or the process of making more black people entering this space. Do you believe it's possible to dismantle structural racism in this field? And also, of course, thank you for your presence and availability to be here with us in this event. Firstly, I would like to wish you a good afternoon to all of you and say about my, the honor to be part of this event, greet Mr. Vargas, which was the idealizer of this event. 
can I say my speech from there so I have some more free I'd like to firstly say that this topic, I understand it's very important for us to have and dedicate some part, some period of our life to analyze effectively this issue of race, structural racism and the representativity of black people in court. Why do I say that? Because at first we say that the idea was to have quotas and that this would solve the problems. And when we were able to do apply these advances through quotas, we uh, thought that uh, for uh, for some moments that the issue was solved. But after 10 years, the number shows that the issue is not solved. The problem is not quotas anymore. To give you know, an, an example, in the tribunal, so you have an idea, every five uh, vacancies we have, only two uh, are fulfilled. So there are remaining vacancies in the public ministry, only 50% are fulfilled. So we see that after these 10 years of quotas, what's the result? We got into a, a number in Brazil of one, 0.7 of black magistrates, which is about 14.5 black judges. These are official. Uh, black judges. So if we compare with uh, the Brazilian population, 55% is declared black. So on an universe of 50% of percent of the population, we have only 14.25, which are actually effectively black. And it's even worse if we look into the projections because of, because of the number of quotas, the CNJ and the believe that in 35 years time, I mean, in 2059, we will reach 22% of black judges. So we will need another 35 years to uh, go over 20%. And this number could not be exact because the CNJ understand that these quotes could be complementary, but uh, these quotas are not uh, complemented because they are not achieved. So this is part of the analysis. Uh, the policy that was developed, implemented, didn't reach its goal. And why not? Because why do you have vacancies that are not fulfilled? Because it's not enough to have vacancies and saying that 50% of the, the tests will be fulfilled by Black people if these people don't have the the training or structure to effectively compete and reach those positions. So if the quarter law for the second step, which is effectively bring conditions so the black population reach this result and are approved in those um, tests. DNJ is being adopting a few proposals which should be mentioned, and we have to keep implementing new strategies and thinking that this is possible. The CNJ has launched recently two measures which I believe are very important, and I'd like to choose. Uh, congratulate Minister Luis Roberto Barroso, which one is the, the score for the tests for the for to become a judge. Each candidate before doing the test have to do another test. So those only those who achieve 
a specific score in this that will be able to do this. has to score correct in 70%, but the person who's declared 50, uh, black will have to score at least 50%. So we believe that we have more people approve. A sponsorship, a scholarship for black people so we could effectively have the possibility for these people to get prepared and take these exams. I'd like to bring another collateral problem that we face, which is the care that we must have for effectively have the people who declare themselves as black to be actually black. So, because there's a, an expression which is called Afro-conveniency, in which people that has never identify or thought themselves as black people now because they believe now they have uh, these scores which are different and lower they understand they could have their way um, in in a more easy way they also declare themselves as black and what's the solution and or what we're trying to do to avoid this a commission of Hetero identification. So in each uh, court, uh, the one in Sao Paulo is the biggest one in the number of processes. And because of that, in the number of enrollments, uh, which I was president of this, of this commission, we analyze each request for the people who declare themselves as black. We did three days of interviews with each of these persons to effectively uh, guarantee that these vacancies and or benefits could effectively be applied for people who deserve this kind of benefits. So um, these are the worry and concerns that we have in these commissions to identify if they deserve and are eligible for this place vacancies. So the scenery is somehow changing. We believe that we are going to have a more black people entering these positions because of the changes we did. And we're going to be careful to make sure that these vacancies are reached by people that definitely uh, deserve this, these vacancies. Still, we effectively need to put the finger in the wood of another problem, which is investment and preparation for the black people can actually have a chance in these uh, national exams. I've been working for 28 years. I had the opportunity to teach in many different universities that I could uh, understand both sides of the coin. I teach in this university, which is very recognizable. It has a 70% score uh, comparing of people entering. We have computers and we have technology, so we can make the students more prone to study and learn the conditions are much better. Uh, the monthly fee is about 4,000 reais. So this is one reality. And we have another one where I teach, where the structures and everything is a lot more. It's a lot worse. Uh, have some difficulties for the lights, for the fan, for the, the, the blackboard. Um, we have problems for the, the students which are not able to pay the fees for the university. And that effectively the teachers are paid with a lower salary. What I'm trying to say here is that it's very hard for people to have the same opportunities if they don't have um, the same conditions. It's important to have these worries. And this is one of the problems of society. The problem in our society is, the question is, 
who is going to help pay for the study, for the training for this group of people. We can turn around and say, oh, this isn't my problem. And then we see the connection with today's seminar. When we talk about public security, and in the first session we had yesterday, an amazing session, someone very correctly said that today, organized crime captures people who have no hope, people who don't have any glimpse of a place in the sun. And it, uh, organized crime allows them to get money, to get status, to get respect because they are members of organized crime. And the big question we have is, what do we want for our young black people? Do we want them to be captured by organized crime or do we want them to study in university to actually occupy the spaces with the quotas? The question is for the young black people to go into the university, someone is going to have to pay for it. We're going to have to effectively pay for that. We can't make miracles with nothing. So in a country where, in a society where we often band together, rightfully so, to support in many different issues that need to be supported, and we feel moved when we see SOSs or different situations that uh, toward a fair cause, we see our society mobilizing. I think it's also uh, worth it for someone to stand up and support young black students so that we can pay for high quality studies for them because otherwise they will not be able to compete on the market. They will not be able to occupy their respective spaces and they will be inexpensive, useful labor for organized crime. There's not much magic there. The question is, do we want to effectively pay for that? Because money doesn't grow on trees. Who is going to pay for their studies? Either we some way seek funds for their studies, or we will allow a few privileged people who can't afford those monthly fees, their tuition, to make the payment and for the others to actually give up. So this discussion needs to be brought up and it's something we need to discuss. Otherwise, we will not change those numbers of representatives in the, uh, the magistrature. Something else is we must be concerned with educating, with raising awareness of the judges who already occupy their positions with regard to causes involving black people. And I say this because very rightfully so in 2021, the CNJ published a protocol for gender perspectives. There is a whole study that was done and preparation for judges to to, to deal with the many different cases they will face with questions related to gender, to harassment, to aggression, and to all the different problems that the female population suffers. Similarly, the CNJ recently published a protocol for racial issues. This was done with a highly qualified working group and the the National Justice Council, the CNJ, is also going to publish another document to judges with regard to these issues that touch on racial topics. And I speak on behalf of my court, we receive many cases, and I, I see that often the judge that does the work doesn't have perception of some some concerns and it's not because they're racist no it's because they've never lived they've never experienced that case i'll give you a simple and public case that occurred recently just to give you an idea of what i'm talking about and the importance of this education there was an argument in a gated community in sao paulo and one of the residents a woman she was black and she was arguing with the president of the HOA and she asked some questions of the administration. And at 
a given point in time, the HOA president says, shut up, you monkey. And this black woman stands up and in a fit of rage says a, a number of different expletives, almost hits the other woman. She says, I'm going to the police. I'm going to file a report for racial harassment, and she does. And then days later, the HOA president filed a moral damage lawsuit because she was uh, offended. And she says, look, I was cursed out and I uh, was offended. He asked for 9,000 reels. And so the judge called both parties and the black woman says, look, she called me a monkey. I have a police report. It's, it's outrageous what she said. And the first result was she, the black woman was found guilty and she was mandated to pay the 9,000 reels. When this case came to us, now listen, I don't want to call anyone racist, but perhaps for a white judge, and in his opinion, offenses uh, mean curses, expletives. That's what actually humiliates someone. He has never been called a monkey. He has never lived that. He, he, he maybe should know, but he maybe didn't know. I'm trying to give a constructive reading of this. He may not know what pain that person felt. He may not know what engendered that reaction. What he does know is how offended someone it becomes how humiliated someone gets when their mother is hurt. So that's what needs to be punished, he may have thought. Well, the the uh, appeals court uh, then uh, found the, the case to not be uh, correct. Now, the woman, the black woman who was called a monkey, she didn't actually sue the other woman because she probably was accustomed to this thing. So she only filed a police report, she didn't sue. So we also need to raise awareness among judges because we will need to judge these cases. I repeat, 14.25% of judges are black. That means we have over 80% of judges who are white. We don't need 50% uh, of judges who are black. What we do need is 100% of judges who are aware and committed to the cause. So I think this racial awareness protocol is going to be successful. I'm sorry for, uh, for, for veering off topic. Uh, Justice Wagner, I have uh, just a couple of comments to make. Now, I mean, you're an, an elegant person, Judge Wagner. You may know, but I mean, sometimes we we uh, we fall into uh, platitudes because we might say, oh, the whites never know because the elites built this condition where they dehumanized the black population. So my question to you is, sir, do you think that by expanding the number of black people in the justice system, we can thereby combat structural racism and reduce it? And lastly, if not, then what would be the new strategies or options to make things so that Brazil stops seeing black punishment to be incarcerated and instead be seen as a population of people that built the wealth of this country and that need to be included in this country? The, the 75 percent who don't have full full justice right well uh, well Marcos your question is very important we can't fall into the trap where we say oh so you're saying that the the courts when the court has black people it is better prepared no
Então, só voltando para tentar é, me ater ao tempo, é, o que me preocupa, e volto a dizer, well, eu acho que esse é o sério da What concerns me, and I think this is the crux of the question, we need to find a way to raise awareness among the whole population that this is a topic that needs to be tackled by everyone. The topic is, again, the question of security. Where do we want our black people, our black population, to go? And for historical reasons, uh, they have less money, they suffered a number of different uh, prejudices and discriminations, and we, as a society, are the only ones who can effectively change the situation. As the minister so wisely said a few minutes ago, money is either public or private. And public funds are limited. So either private society finds a way to see that we must give black youth a way out to not be captured by crime. Or we are going to create these conditions. So either we, we, we find a way to improve the situation or we'll soon not even have a society anymore. I want to wrap by saying that people often ask themselves, why do I have to pay for this? Why does the check come to me? And well, because it's poetic, but we are all the same. We need to find a place of brotherhood. And uh, René Blanco, when he wrote the song, the, uh, the Board of the Divine, the Divine Board, I want to quote this song lyric, and your humble translator will attempt to translate. Don't talk to the poor, don't hold hands with blacks, don't carry packages. Why are you posturing, doctor? Why are you so proud? A blind wick knocks into us and our life ends. A heart attack will catch you, doctor, and the, the board will end. Put the dumb people on top and pull out the ladder and stay nearby, but wait and don't hold your breath. But at some point, they will fall and hit their face on the ground. The taller you are, the harder you'll fall. When the life ends, you're all going to be under the ground, lying down. Thank you. Thank you, Judge, Judge Wagner. Thank you. We will take this opportunity to wrap up this session. And thank you to Judge, Judge Wagner for bringing up such an important topic, so important for the country. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Judge Wagner. An official photograph. Agradecemos aos palestrantes. We'd like to thank the speakers. And now we will move on with the International Seminar on Public Security, Human Rights and Democracy. This next panel is titled Imprisonment and Human Dignity. In just a few moments, we will adjust the stage, just a moment. Já convido ao palco o Frade. I would like to invite up on stage the Dominican friar, journalist and writer, Mr. Friar Beto. Seja muito bem-vindo. Welcome. Frei Beto é graduado em jornalismo. Friar Beto has a degree in journalism, anthropology, philosophy and theology. He is the author of 74 books published in Brazil and abroad. He has received the Jabuti Award in 1982 for his book on memoirs called the Baptism of Blood. He has a long history of social, uh, social justice militancy. He supported the 
president's office and he participated in the zero hunger program he is a counselor at the justice and peace commission for sao paulo we'd like to invite also the president of the ire dr valfredo Varde, to moderate this panel This is my moral fellow friend. If we all had read his, um, read his books, listened to his speeches, and know about his trajectory in life, uh, Frei Beto is in itself an oracle of ethics in Brazil, one of the biggest thinkers uh, nowadays in Brazil. Uh, the one alive, and I would love to hear from him talking about imprisonment and human dignity. So we understand that these are not place for people. They should not be. The floor is yours. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. I'd like to uh, greet Valfrida. Well, thanks for this invitation. Thank also all of you here present, especially three friends, which is Bruno Manso, José Dirceu, and Vicente Trevas, which I thank so much for your presence. We have a trajectory of life together. I feel comfortable to talk about imprisonment topic because maybe I'm the only person I've heard there's a thousand people participate in this event. I might be the only one in which was uh, in prison, common imprisonment. During dictatorship, I was uh, in prison. I was four years in jail, and two years later, as a, a prisoner, I was removed from the, the, the relationship with the politicians. And also, I'd like to ask the Ministry of Justice, because it said that the number of common prisoners has never changed. It always remains the same. And I've gone through three different um, prisons uh, in Sao Paulo, Carandiru, and for a longer time, President Veseslau was nowadays the PCC command, co command the organized organization is. I should say that after two years in prison, I was condemned for another four. I was condemned for four, but it was reduced for two years. So I am a Brazilian that can commit any crime in which the verdict is, is done and is the punishment is prepaid. My experience as a common prisoner made me get into the conclusion that it's very easy to re-socialize them, but there's no interest of the state for those who want to um, deepen your knowledge in this topic. I recommend two of my books. One is Cartas da Prisão, and the second one is uh, Fernando's Diary from Editora Who. These two books uh, translate very well what were these two years living with common prisoners. Uh, in jail, we were six uh, political prisoners together with 400 common prisoners. So how... We, there was no earth land there. Everything was paved, so nobody could uh, hit anything under the, war, uh, the earth, and everyone had its own cell. So the experience produced a big effect in the incarcerated population. The first initiative was to create a theater group. I was, had an experience before. I have um, done the play Hey Da Vela, and I used to apply the Paulo Freire methodology 
So I was able to build a theater group, which was a therapeutic group, let's say. I'd ask my colleagues to tell their crimes. Not all of them would be open to that proposal, but those who were would, would tell us their crimes and we were we would create a play representing the crimes that they have committed. So for example, my fellow Pardal has uh, told the crime that he committed. He went into a farm and killed a couple. And after that, he took care of the, the farm. He stole the car and so on. And then we would invert the roles in this play. And this would bring a reflection on the different places of positioning. So for example, when you ask a common prisoner to do the role of the police or to do the role of the victim that he has killed, this have a reaction in their brain which take them into the reflection. The second activity that we did was um, studying program each one of us uh, became a teacher of um, a topic. It was a high school equivalent. And we would have uh, exams. And there, we were able to do a interesting work where we changed the paradigms of, uh, of the jails because before the common prisoners would only talk. So uh, the common prisoners would only talk about criminality. And when we started those um, high school uh, program, and for the surprise of the managers of the the, the the jail, many people have enrolled, but we didn't have a specific time for those lessons. So we're exactly on the three hours breaks we had. So meaning those who would go to the lessons would not have their breaks. So. Anyway, we were able to create two groups and this changed their paradigms because they didn't only, they, they went from talking about crime and pornography to Machado de Assis, the writer, math, history of Brazil, and so on. And these, the study, the students of those courses started having a, a preponderance preponderance of knowledge over the, the other prisoners. And the third initiative that we did with a lot of strength that we put into it was that the, the jail would sell one radio to each in prisoners. So how, how would they buy their um, the radios? Yes, we did have money. Uh, some allowance that we were able to to buy those radios with the money of this called Percurio. We still don't know exactly um, how it did happen, uh, like the prisoner, the prison buying so many radios to sell to the prisoners. But anyway, why did don't we invest in the resocialization of the prisoners, men and women. Most of them are women that have never committed a crime, but for love, they try to, to take some drugs to their partners, which were inside of jails. And then because of this act, goes into jail, she becomes a prisoner, and therefore start living with people that have committed serious crimes. So this is terrible. Many of the women now in jail haven't committed any crime. They just try to help their partners, which were in, inside of the prisons, and therefore 
they became arrested. And we noticed this, and the state has no interest. Those on finding a solution. You can read one of my books saying, why do the state have no interest in the resocialization of the common prisoners? It's clear that the common prisoner was not born a criminal. I was convinced, and each anyone here in this room have, have gone through their deseducation that they had would also be a criminal, would also be a hooker. It's not that the person was a bad person and committed a crime, it's that the person became desperate. This is proved with all the traditional psychology psychology traditions that we have learned, those people are those who have been beaten the, the most by their parents, mostly by their father, which means that this hate that they carry inside of a kid that has been beaten many times because they were ignorant. They didn't know how to teach. I remember a story of a man that used to work in a store and something felt in his feet and it broke it. And then his wife had to leave to be, to work cleaning. And the son had to help in the house. The father would not be able to find a job because he was injured. And then he was very angry. He started beating both the, his wife and his child. So a child, when is raised in this environment, what do you think it will happen? Do you think that he, he or she would be ethical? They have uh, big aspirations professionally? No, that won't happen, especially in a society where all its subjectivity is managed by the capitalism system, capitalist system. How does these people can be included socially? Normally it's by the belongs that they have. If they don't have nothing, it's as if they don't are not worth anything. When I was a journalist of reality a newspaper, we took um, um, homeless person, took them to a shopping mall, and then we dressed them up, took them shower. He would, one month later, we put them in a Mercedes Benz with all these clothes, with a, two, a tie and suit, and stopped in the front of a mansion, and he was received in a very well manner. So what happened? What happened was that what he was dressing, what he showed, what was it, what counted. So basically, in this society, we don't have value as a person. What is like labels that shows what we are is what people see. That's what unfortunately is has the protagonism in the social relations. The, Imprisonment doesn't work enough on the socialization aspect. One objective, one subjective. All the jails could be excellent um, training schools, but I've met some Mr. Geraldo in, that spent eight years with the broom cleaning all the time the same place. Many people that worked in a shoe shop, they were not able to do anything else. Also with clothes, they each of them were doing exactly the same things every now and then, but they, they wouldn't have them taught to be more professional, or grow professionally. So what's the situation? to make people have high esteem. 
they were not able to do that because they were have imprinted in their souls that they were not able to do that. This work is not done. And from the contrary, all the, the system has very bad approach. So you have an idea in the uh, prison, we were not able to have mirrors in the cells. So many of the imprisoned who would go into the doctor's office only to have a look on the mirror because that it was the only one available there. Have you ever noticed that when we look when we look in the mirror, we don't usually check the shape of our faces? High steam means that you are able to see yourself physically, and that was not able in the prisons. Also, no imprisoned was called by names. Now they are privatizing schools in the state of Paraná. This is a crime because today, on average, the Brazilian state spends 41 reals per month per, per, per uh, incarcerated person. And if it's privatized, it's going to be even more expensive. And th because they are, they have a vested interest in having even more prisoners. The more prisoners, the more they will earn. And not to mention that today prisons are commanded by the criminal factions. And no one asks about the re-socialization policy, how this can be tackled. The system is deeply corrupt. The entire system is deeply corrupt. The wardens, the officers. I remember Colonel Geddes, who was director of the Karandiru prison, which was built to house 1,300 prisoners. And at my time, there were 5,000 men in there. This was before the massacre that occurred. 5,000 men. One day, talking to Colonel Geddes, I asked him, Colonel, how can you allow them to have their fill of drugs? There's uh, an auction block or transvestite prostitutes, everything. And he said, the only things I don't allow in here are two things, women and helicopters. Everything else is allowed. Why? Because I'm sitting on top of a powder keg. I know it's going to explode someday. And my mission here is to delay this explosion. He knew this. He knew this. He was, he was fine with it. So there is no policy there are some institutes like Humanitas 360, which I want to highlight the work of this institute. And uh, and I work with women creating cooperatives to professionalize them within prison as an extension of the, of the co-op. There is uh, work done with their family members. So not only are they freed from exploration by the criminal organizations but when they leave the prison they have been trained they have a small business which is sewing handicraft cooking and so on there are other institutes as well humanity 360 is not the only one but it is very easy to do this type of work what is not very common is the intention to give you an example of the police actions, a prisoner leaves after eight years in Wenceslau prison. He had gone back to Wenceslau and I asked him, why did you go back? And he said, "I when I left, I wanted to turn my life around. I got a job at a factory. We manufactured musical instruments because the owner of that factory was part of a, a, a restorative association for to uh, rehabilitate criminals, and he felt uh, he felt sorry for me. And at first, he used to pay me minimum wage. One day, leaving the factory, I was stopped by the military police. The officer called me up and said, hey, listen, 
we we know we know all about you you're going to have to pay us 1 grand every month which is half of a monthly minimum wage if you don't pay us any problems that happen here we will deliver you up and who's going to complain so what can you do in a situation like that it's like that song from Chico Buarque, call the crook, call the crook. What can you do when the police are extorting you? When the police are extorting a criminal to receive funds from corruption and even making life even harder for that, that individual who intended to have a decent job. Another former prisoner told me, Beto, when I was holding people up in Pacaembu without, uh, without joining any gangs, everything was fine because I was covered by the Pacaembu precinct. So I would hold up a residence. The homeowner complained to the chief of police and he'd say, look, Here's the list of stolen items, but I don't really care about my stereo, about the China. But there is a watch that belonged to my grandfather that really hurts me to have lost it, that it was stolen. Please find it. Please find it, officer. And so the chief of police would tell us, listen, that grandfather's clock, that, that watch needs to be returned because we used to sell it to the... Uh, to to the pawn shop but then we we just returned the walk the chief of police would call up the homeowner and say listen we we didn't actually find it but we learned that this walk was was stolen was sold to a fence to a pawn shop but he's not a criminal so you'll have to pay him and so the homeowner paid the chief of police even more money to get the watch back. So it is a vicious cycle of crime and corruption, and it's all linked. Now, it is possible to create a prison policy inside of the capitalist system, within the corrupt system, that is able to repersonalize to a great extent because prisoners are like children. And actually, I should mention, if you go into a prison full of common prisoners, and if you bring in kids aged two to six, there is absolutely no risk of any harm coming to them. There was an Adventist pastor in Wenceslau prison, he had six kids and they were the choir, they sang in the choir for the services that were held there on Saturday. It was the only services that were held in the prison, they had 200 seats and it was the only service that the entire population of prisoners went for, he had to hold services twice. First 200 and then 200 more. People were delighted to see those little kids. Why? Because they identify with them. And uh, woe be it to someone who is arrested for harming children. You know, it's, they're, they're, there's going to be hell to pay. And of course, the causes of criminality are very difficult. First, we need to reduce inequality. Second, we need to improve education and the uh, we need to make education more universal. We need to put everyone in school. Third is to create a culture of ethics, which is not easy at all. So these measures are possible. But when you remove self-esteem from a man like that or a woman like that, and you move move their self-esteem from criminality to a profession. To give you an example, we saw painting workshops. We had painters who were highly talented. They could copy famous 
paintings because the prison warden lived in the city of Presidente Prudente, not Presidente Wenceslao. And outside of the prison, he played a lot of cards and he paid for his gambling debts with those paintings. And we put an end to that. We, we put those prisoners to be creative. And at the time, we had, uh, we had some catalogs here where uh, famous Brazil, large Brazilian publishers sold these paintings through contacts that we have. So anyway, they are all interested in changing their lives. Many of them are, anyway. I remember that Eric Overismo, the author, sold, sent me four huge boxes of books to send to the prison. One day we were uh, overseeing the library and we lent the time and the wind to one of the prisoners. And he said, please wait two or three more months because I'm copying the book. I really love it. And he, I'm copying it. He had bought these thick notebooks to copy the time and the wind. And I said, man, I can give you a copy of that book. Don't waste time. So, in other words, what they lack is opportunity. We don't give them education. We don't have people who are prepared to deal with prison population. And the wardens are not prepared. Many of them receive a uh, very, very low pay. And so they, too, are, uh, are co-opted by the, the factions. At the, my, during my day, we called them gangs, but now they are factions, and they threaten the uh, the the prison officers' families. And they say, "Look, if you don't put marijuana or acid or cocaine, and you don't bring it to the prison, we will kill your family." And so the prison officers will give in. So who brings? Who brings drugs into prison or phones today and other goods, uh, knives, the prison officers, because they're not trained, they're not supported to by the, uh, the system to resist. And so when they are intimidated, they give in. So I want to conclude by saying that we cannot feed into this prejudice, saying that, oh, a good prisoner is a dead prisoner. We can't say that. We can't think that. First, we must radically defend the human dignity of every human being. And the first person to say this was Jesus Christ. He was the first person to state in the history of, of mankind that a human can be blind, they may be... Uh, they may have leprosy, they may be an amputee, they may be deaf or mute, but they are a living temple of God. In other words, this holiness that Jesus Christ uh, applies to every human being is the very basis of all human rights. It's the very first time in history where human suffering was not segregated, where no human was deemed to be uh, someone you could be exploited. Every person is a living temple. So this, this, uh, this ethic, this moral, is something that we are a thousand light years away from. But we must, we must see a, a holy being in every human being and thinking, being aware that we could also be in their roles. We, all of us here in this room, are the fruits of a biological lottery. None of us chose our, our genetics, our, the family. Muito obrigado, querido amigo Frei Beto. Obrigado Thank por you palavras. very much, my dear friend, Fire Beto. Thank you for your words.
Obrigada, Frei Beto. Foto Thank oficial. Thank you, Friar Beto. Let's take the official picture for this panel. Obrigada. Thank you. Já vamos seguir com o próximo painel. All right, let's just wait a couple of moments to adjust the seats on the stage and we will move on to our next session. We are now in the second day of the International Seminar on Public Security, Human Rights and Democracy. Vamos lá então, o próximo painel, encarceramento. All right, now let's move on to the next session, pre-trial incarceration. Now let's invite up on stage the very honorable minister Gilmar Mendes. Gilmar Mendes is a justice of the Supreme Federal Court. He was president of the Supreme Federal Court from 2008 to 2010. He was president of the National Council of Justice of partner of the IDP. We'd also like to ask Dr. Valfredo Varde to stay here on stage to moderate this session. Mr. Gilmar, I know this is a topic that is very dear to your heart because we have thousands of people who are currently incarcerated without any kind of sentencing. Often they are abandoned by the justice system. They have no legal support. And considering the size of our country and how hard it is to manage justice here in Brazil, we have a very significant problem. And you know this problem very well. Could you please teach us about this, the state of the problem and what we can do to resolve it? Yes, we have developed the CNJ from 2008. We know that we've been having a massive incarceration. We went from 1 million, 100, 200 of imprisoned, imprisoned and 40% are provisory. So pre-trials or the defined trials Nowadays, there was a uh, significant reduction on this number. While I was ahead of a CNJ from 2008 to 2010, we have launched the first project which called Multirão Carcerario, which was an idea to ask a, a judge to visit the jails with together with their colleagues so we could uh, do a follow-up in the reality of the uh, the jails and we saw situations which are very alarming 22,000 people were freed in that action even more we were able to regulate the idea that we have produced distortions which are common in the profession judges which were there were judges that had not visited a jail, so it was a situation in which was very peculiar, but unfortunately, it existed in that at that time. We, when we met someone which was 
incarcerated with with without with pre-trial in Fortaleza and later in Vitoria, we also met someone which was imprisoned with a pre-trial for 14 years. So this is very alarming. From there on, we created at the CNJ, which is an de important department, which has for some time, I judge Lanfredi from Sao Paulo, we have created the monitoring of the prisoner system. So CNJ started having a system of monitoring for the prisoner system and started doing those uh, su surveillance. One thing that we found in this program that we did, which is very interesting when we start doing uh, public, public policies, was that we used to think that the problem was we had too many too many people judged but, but what we understood that they didn't have the, the right uh, many of these imprisoned were imprisoned without a trial so about 40%. So we started doing this work, which constituted later the DNR. Later, this work has advanced, and we were able to author uh, the legislation regarding pretrial, which was very open regarding the Article 319, which says uh, on the possibility of the ankle surveillance in many cases, but many problems arose. And as we said at the beginning of the, the seminar, what's the competency of the state and the, and the federal government? So what we could do with the budgeting to how could we allocate that money so all the red tape that we had, and we started overcoming them. At the CNJ, we started getting different requests from the Inter-American of Human Rights Organization. It's the, after the arrest, we'd put a judge there to see the, the person. So we started adopting the audience de custodia. Here there's a, a problem, a cultural problem we have to look into. The incarceration culture, if there is an incident, we take it to jail and also the We don't, we cannot have the custody hearing as a way to understand if it's a case of imprisonment or not. If maybe it's a crime without violence, we, we need to understand those differences. Another learning that we had when we were visiting uh, the prisons and we tried to to work on and we need to return working on it is the on the perspective of resocialization both from the person that leaves the provisory prisons of also those who have um, spent their resocialization time. There is a foundation, uh, APENAR, in the federal district, which we have 40 vacancies in the Supreme Court. I usually have four vacancies for people who leave the prison system. My, the person that helps, you know, uh, moving books and chairs, is one of these persons that have left prisons which are free for over 10 years. 
Marcelo, yes. So we need to work on that. And we have been working a lot in this program, which is called Começar de Novo, Start Again, which created a space also in the public services. And so this was a very good initiative and we have to highlight it in order so we are able to not only apply it as a program of human rights. Some may say, oh, there is another speech about uh, human rights. No, that's not right. This is a public security problem. Back that we need to work on. And of course, we have to invest a lot in the training of the criminal judge. So all these procedures that are now a reality, understand when we should have the provisory imprisonment. And so we can understand, so when it's gonna have a, a sentence or not. There are many different cases. I don't have the exact numbers, but in this giant country that we live in, we have some situations for many different reasons in which we delay so much the trial, homicide, crimes, or... I went to uh, Guararapes, and over there, there were of about a thousand cases of homicide. Why? Because the trials didn't happen. This is a very solemn trial. Justice has to organize themselves, the, the attorneys. So we have to look into this issue and everything has to do with the justice system. I hope that I have answered your questions. Thank you very much, Minister. A uh, big hand of applause to the Minister. Of the pre-trial incarcerations. We have seen from the car wash trials, the problems of incarceration, and there is a a report from Raleigh Payne that there is a significant number of imprisonment with pre-trial, which extends themselves for nine months. I'd like you to briefly talk a little bit, what should we do in our legislation to create objective criteria in order to limit the timing of this imprisonment? I have uh, the impression that this is a theme that should be faced. And also it should actually be discussed and maybe we should do alterations in the legislations in order to make sure uh, what, who are in, into jail or not and also understand the responsibility of the judges. We know that the time frame exists in cases like this, when you have people accused, which are incarcerated, we need, we also know that there are escapes uh, because of the difficulties of the institution for things like this. So it's important that we look into this issues and uh, accountability is done in the judicial system as a whole in order to is, is discussed in an environment which is somehow distorted where we are kind of freeing people that committed crimes. So, yes, let me tell you a story that reminded me, that, that took me into this topic. 
with more emphasis. When I was in the vice president of the Supreme Court, uh, Minister Ella was the president, and she asked me to, to have a judge from Canada. She was a commissioner from the United Nations and from the Human Rights Department that would come to Brazil. This is uh, understand the state of our prisons. So in this case, specifically of this judge, she focused in the conversation she had with me on the issue of an episode that everyone that deals with this theme might know, which is the imprisonment of a, a lady in Bahia Pituba in the Paris state, which was incarcerated together with men and was for 30 days brutally violated. This lady, then she starts talking about what happened or and asking questions. And so I was giving those explanations in front of an international authority saying that we had this double surveillance, a surveillance of the administration of the, the prisons, the state and surveillance, and also the surveillance of the judiciary. Well, she had that British um, way of being. She said, yes, basically, abuses uh, occur in many countries, also in ours, but do you believe that was the question that she made. Do you believe that isn't it too much to take 30 days to find out and solve the problem? So she wasn't there in Bayatetuba. Yes, so there was a big problem that day, on that situation. It was investigated by the CNJ. There were so many distortions and omissions and judicial fails and administration fails. And when I had to answer that question, there was no other answer. I had to say yes. And so I asked myself, I told myself, never gonna face challenges like this anymore without not only from the practical standpoint, to visit the prisons, things change when an authority goes there and have a look, but also try to change legislation. I believe nowadays we have the conditions, especially because of technology, uh, to be able to monitor the minister of the uh, Supreme Court, Rosa. She did these visits, but now, uh, with technology. So from the way I see it, we are able to do a control and include, make sure, uh, understand which of the places have different numbers and understand what the problems. So that's how I think the way, how we should act more over than change uh, laws, which eventually could establish frameworks to obligate the judges, uh, promoters, to make sure who are freed or not in cases uh, there are excesses. Usually in the court, we purposes because of excessive time, excessive waits, and this could have some serious issues, but sometimes the individual has been arrested, has been in prison for nine years because of the uh, charge of uh, murder that was never proven.
Vamos lá, então, para o próximo painel do nosso Seminário Internacional de Segurança All Pública. All right, let's move on to our next session in our seminar. O painel agora é... vai debater... Soluções... This next session will discuss solutions for crackland. I'd like to invite up on stage the Honorable... Uh, Federal Deputy, Mr. Guilherme Boulos. Guilherme Boulos is the Federal Deputy from the PSOL, Sao Paulo. He is a professor and author with a degree in philosophy and a Master of Psychiatry from the University of Sao Paulo. He was a candidate for president in 2018. I'd also like to invite the coordinator of the Center for Public Security at the IRE, Mr. Benedito Mariano. Benedito Mariano is coordinator of the Center for Public Security at the IRE. He's a sociologist and master of social sciences from the PUC Sao Paulo. He was ombudsman for the police in Sao Paulo and the uh, citizenship police liaison for the city of Diadema. I'd also like to invite Dr. Eloisa Arruda. Eloisa Arruda is a professor of criminal procedural law at the PUC Sao Paulo. She is a doctor and master of social relations law and criminal procedural law, also from PUC Sao Paulo. And to moderate this session, I'd like to invite Dr. Valfredo Varde, president of the AREE, to whom I will now pass the floor. <laughs> wow, I think I'm, I've been cloned. I've been here for so long now. We, we, it's, uh, the question of the crackland is truly uh, a visceral question for me because we deal with human life and many people uh, are, uh, treat human life in a way that is almost disposable. All of you have proposed or intend to propose solutions for crackland. This is not a simple problem. It is a public security and public health problem. It is about uh, small scale and large scale criminality. There are criminal factions involved with this stain on our, our society, this wound to our society. And criminality is, uh, it is, uh, it is destroying families, destroying human lives. And to this day, we have not yet found a solution for this problem. Perhaps you, Mariano and Eloisa, and perhaps you, Guilherme, who have studied and uh, dealt with the problem directly, can help us think about solution. Mariano, can we begin with you? Good afternoon, everyone, once again. I'd like to first congratulate the IREE, specifically the president, Valfredo, for this unprecedented seminar, a huge hit with a huge success with sessions that have discussed public security and democracy in so many different facets. I would like to greet my dear friend, Guilherme Bolas, a pre-candidate for mayor of Sao Paulo. He knows he has my unlimited support for his pre-candidature. He's going to represent renewal and a fresh air in Sao Paulo. And the eternal secretary, Eloisa Arruda, sorry for mispronouncing your name, Eloisa, 
I would like to be brief because I really want to listen to to Bolos and to Eloisa. But I was I had the honor of for a year and a half being coordinator of the damage reduction program for the crackland under Mayor Haddad, who is currently Minister of the Treasury for Brazil. And for me, it was an extraordinary experience. I had never worked with the damage reduction before, and I learned so much in working together with other dockets. I worked under the city plan docket, and we, in the open arms coordinated coordination, we had a collegiate with healthcare, human rights, social security, and social services. I think that when we discuss solutions for crackland, first, we need to say that it will not be solved by one single ministry. It needs to be a multi-sector interdisciplinary solution. And this was the experience we had in the open arms program. The Open Arts Program had three pillars. First, ensuring that the uh, the uh, recipients of the program had housing, social services, and work, employment. Of course, this is not a formal job from a nine to five because of the conditions of the individuals who lived there. They were users of crack but we did have four hour long workshops and the vast majority of those who agreed to take part in the program really uh, benefited from it we had 800 recipients and i want to tell you the result of this policy it established health care employment and social services over 80% of them reduced their use of crack. Over 75% went back to uh, resumed contact with their families because many, uh, many drug users in crackland often hadn't seen their families for three or even five years. Sadly, this is a challenge of the public management and the management that came after Fernando Haddad in, just destroyed the program. So our dream is that the policy that was developed in this region can once again be similar to what happened in the CEUs created by Mayor Marta, because every single other mayor that came after her incorporated this program, the CEUs. Of course, the topic of drugs and security is more difficult than the unified education, which is the case of the CEUs. But I think that crackland can be looked at from three different angles. Alfredo has mentioned the first, which is the perspective of social, uh, pardon, of public security. On average, at least during the time when I was coordinator of the program. During that time, in that space, which is less than 80 square meters, which is part of one street block, over 100 kilograms of crack every month. So for an 80 meter long stretch of a road, 80 to 100 kilograms of crack per month. Who distributed all of that crack? Were they within the 2,000 drug users in the crackland? Of course not. They were probably living in gated residences, in gated communities. And this is perhaps the, mo the greatest challenge we face ever since the rise of the so-called crackland, because a civil police was not able to do the police intelligence work that was needed to repress with intelligence those major drug traffickers who distribute crack in that region, the loose neighborhood. 
until we can reduce that distribution, we will continue to have the crackland phenomenon in Sao Paulo. The second perspective is that crackland is a public health problem. We have drug users there. And so the state and the city specifically have the strategic role of working on public health in a way that is intersectorial, interdisciplinary, interdepartmental. At the time of Fernando Haddad's administration, we put together an office for the coordination right on that street so that we had everyday contact with everyone in Crackland. We even hosted an exhibit in the Sao Paulo Cultural Center with the recipients of the program before and after the program. And it was startling. They physically looked like different people because their self-esteem improved. The individuals started looking after their physical bodies. They acquired new perspectives new outlooks, and this was plain to see in the before and after pictures, before and after the program. So the damage reduction policy was pivotal for looking after, for caring for those drug users. And the third perspective of Crackland is the real estate price aspect. For the for the uh, real estate investors, they want crackland because for the real estate uh, moguls, they want crackland to persist for 50 years because the more those properties are devalued, the more money they will make. So in my opinion, we have to work on those aspects Unfortunately, the public health aspect did not persist, but we need to work on that, that aspect of facing, of tackling the major drug distributors. And we, we even need to find out where they're located because they're certainly not located in the loose region. Third is we need to resume a program to care for drug users with walk-in clinics, with healthcare work. And thirdly, we need to work very strongly. The city hall needs to work to rescue that neighborhood. And for that, it's crucial for us to restart an inspector's office that was begun during Fernando Haddad's revision. I was, uh, I had I was fortunate to be his uh, uh, one of one of the workers there under his administration. We need we did a number of things. We reduced and mediated conflict between the, the drug users who spend 24 hours a day there in that region, ensuring security for the residents and the merchants, because those three categories of people are victims of the drug traffickers who distribute thousands of kilograms of drugs in that region. Without that combination of factors, we will not solve this problem. So looking at the problem of crackland with drug users from the perspective of caring for them, the same perspective of care that must be had with the resident merchants, shopkeepers, who are victims of that situation, and particularly with real estate speculation and demanding that the state act differently. We discuss the importance of police intelligence to fight large-scale crime. Without intelligence, we cannot fight organized crime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guilherme. Do you agree? with Benedito Mariano, please. Now, um, and Luis Arruda. Um, 
So, uh, good afternoon to everyone. I would like, firstly, thanks for the invitation made by my dear friend, Valfredo Vargi. Valfredo, the importance and the grandiosity of this event is, reflects the importance, the importance and the greatness of your person who could be peacefully in your office, but is worried with, with where Brazil is going. So you are very important leadership. You are able to bring together people from different political visions, because I know that you like listening. You are humble enough to listen and reflect and learn. And you lead a wonderful team, which is the IE, I, -R -I, -E. I hope that this is the first from many other events like this. I'd like to thank all your team that was very successful in providing us comfort in this space over here. So thank you again. I'd like to greet Guilherme Bodlos, dear friend, Benedito Mariano, in which some moments in life we've been together. What I'm going to talk today is what I learned from experiences, my own experiences as a Secretary of Justice of the State of Sao Paulo and later as the Secretary of Human Rights of the City of Sao Paulo, and that I believe we should perpetuate projects and actions that worked, and I'm obviously going to criticize what hasn't worked and also can be improved. So these are some of the aspects that I'm going to bring here today. So to understand the problem that we have today, we have to go back to 2001, when we had the psychiatric reform in Brazil. That moment, the, there was the abolition of the, some clinics, asylums, and what happened to the drug user was the Psychosocial Attention Center. CAPS. But in that moment, there was a vacuum. And why? The CAPS works in this, this way. It's a volunteered attention. The person has to go there to have an attention, and that has to be continued. But there was a vacuum relating to what specifically? To situations in which people in high vulnerability which had their health already damaged and psychological as well in a state of uh, social vulnerability would look for a medical assistant and would not find it. Because the problem was those who had uh, more serious problems would go to the health, the public health system, but the, the public health system was also not ready to deal with people in this state. What happened in Brazil is that the issue of the organized crime related to tra drug trafficking and the rise in the number of um, drug users in Brazil. With all that done, the report of um, uh, drugs and alcohol users shows that we have directly or indirectly hit by the drug addiction in Brazil, at least one in each 10 Brazilians. Because if someone has one, fa one addict in its family, it's possible that it impacts all the other people in the family. And it's not difficult to understand the reason. It's a mother that has a son in the state of drug addiction that goes into despair because she doesn't know how to deal with the situation. In a certain point, this son started to sell the the belongings in the house, and and she doesn't know what to do. The individuals fall into depression, and the end result is that either that mother gets desperate and kicks the child out of the house, or the child, when no longer has anywhere else to turn to, will start living on the street. 
This is a phenomenon that has grown and continues to grow. And when we talk about the crackland, we need to say that this is not a phenomenon limited to the city of Sao Paulo. It is a Brazilian phenomenon, even in some small city. We don't like the word crackland, but in any case, it became you, uh, the, the, the common parlance for these centers of where drugs are used. We have a population of almost 30 million Brazilians who are impacted by drug use. So this report is from 2021. It's a survey of three large cities. This is the result of the fifth report. It is done by the Federal University of the city of Sao Paulo in Sao Paulo, in Fortaleza, and in Brasilia. The numbers I will present are from Sao Paulo, which is the city where I worked and that I'm familiar with. Today, in the large crackland in Sao Paulo, which is in the Luce neighborhood, the Luce district, which is very close to the center, the city center of Sao Paulo. It's near the historic uh, building, Sala Sao Paulo, the uh, theater house, the Portuguese language museum, and many other historic buildings. We have 74% men, 23% women, and 4% transgender. And in this profile of visitors of Crackland, of users of Crackland, I would also add that the vast majority of them are black or mixed race individuals and very, uh, very little amount of education. I just didn't want to exaggerate on the graph. Now for the prevalence of the use of crack and cocaine, 79% use crack, but some use both crack and cocaine. 1% use only cocaine, 38% use only cocaine, and 22% use only crack. 15% of them who are there don't use cocaine or crack. So why are they there? Where often they are there to protect themselves because they are people who are living on the street and the group protects the group. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that they are people who have warrants out for their arrest and they find support and they hide basically among the drug users. Others are that some individuals have serious mental issues such as chronic alcoholism who live there, but they don't use other drugs. This report is from 2021. The mean time of the use of crack. Now I should mention I'm, I'm giving out this information to then give some comments. The time, the duration of use among men, the question was, how long have you been using crack? Men, 16 years. How much? 16 crack rocks per day, per day. Time of use among women, 13 years. The amount of crack rocks per day, 24. Among transgender people, the average time of use was 13 crack rock, uh, 13 years, and the quantity is 26 crack rocks per day. Now the prevalence of re reasons for frequenting that location. And there we see what Benedito said. The greatest reason for people being there is that crack is more available there. Obviously, it's more available in that region. It's easy to find crack there. Then we have other reasons. Crack is cheaper there. It's, more, it's safer to use crack here. I have access to a place to live. I have friends or relatives in the region. I'd rather use in locations where there are other users. I've been abandoned by my family. I want to spare my family from my use and freedom or preference. Those are some reasons, but the main reason is the availability of crack in that region. Now the question of whether they needed emergency services. Requiring emergency services means that the individual 
either had a psychotic break, that's one example. A woman went into labor because there are not few situations where women give birth inside of crackland. They give birth, they go into labor, and they often do give birth inside of crackland. So if you needed any kind of emergency service, now we have a drug called K. You've all seen images and videos of K users. The individual falls into a long-term psychotic break. Sometimes they collapse on the ground immediately. They may injure, injure themselves. So these are individuals who require emergency services. 24% men, 38% women, and 8% transgender. Here's another important factor for what I'm going to mention, again from 2021. One third of women do not use any contraceptive method. And there are not few situations where they prostitute themselves to buy the crack rocks and they become pregnant. And the children are then born with symptoms of crack absence. I know because I have a daughter who is a pediatrician, works in the public system in the Menino Jesus Hospital, public hospital, and they receive babies who have crack abstinence because their mothers are crack users because they don't use any contraceptives. Now, prevalence of factors for the reduction or interruption of use. The most important of these is support from the family or friends. That is the most important factor. If the individual has support from their family and friends, that's the most important. Then we see other things, employment, treatment, a child being born, a hard time getting access to drugs, going back home, lack of money. But the greatest motivation is having support from their family. Now, once we've seen that, well, that report was published in 21. I was no longer Secretary of Justice or Human Rights, but I was very happy to see that this was systematized in a scientific study done by the UNIFEST University. Because when I joined the Secretary of Justice in 2011, this image that you see, this from uh, Elvetia Street, this is the Sao Paulo crackland in Elvetia Street. I was invited by Governor Alckmin. I was a public prosecutor, a professor at PUC. I had never worked in politics before. And I entered the Secretary of Justice and I intended to uh, become apprised with the problems in my docket. And I saw that there was no coordination in the state of Sao Paulo in spite of this image that we see here to deal, to specifically deal with the question of drug addiction. We didn't have a coordination. We had a council, which still exists to this day, a drug use council, but they didn't have any executive power at all. And I said, but this is the most important thing for us to do. We need to, at the very least, within the cross-sectional department, we need to see what each of us is doing. We need to sit down at the same table. And with that goal, I sat down with the governor. I arrived in January and in June 8th, 2011, we created the state coordination on drug policies, which was designed for us to sit down at the same table and discuss potential solutions. And what we found was that there were some isolated steps here and there. In the issue of hospitals, there was absolutely nothing, nothing specific about hospitals. Civil society worked through some organizations such as Maranon, um, uh, loving people from the region and other NGOs and they could tell us about some of the demands. From that point, what we heard was that there was a complete failure of the system. 
the uh, psychosocial support centers are important. They must remain and be expanded, but they cannot handle the full scope of the problem. They can't handle it. So what we need is to create more beds in hospitals. And we wanted to hear the mothers. I always like hearing mothers. And they would tell me, Dr. Eloisa, I'm bringing my son to the, the CAP, the psychosocial center. And they'll say, bring your kid in next week. But my child is destroying my house today. He needs to be admitted. And I said, well, to be admitted, he needs a doctor. Well, what should I do? The mother would say, well, you can't forcibly admit someone. If you want to do that, we need authorization from a physician saying that the individual needs to be admitted. We also need a warrant from the public ministry or support from the public prosecutor's office and lawyers and a court order. Oh, but doing that took forever. They'd need to go to the public prosecutor's office. They need to look for the public ministry. And I said, hang on, why don't we put together all of that support into one single location, a place where we can ensure the rights of drug users and their families? We did have a building near the main crackland in Elvesia Street. It was a building on Pratt Street where there was a look, it was a great building. The building you see there, it was a great building. But it was underused. Who did they see? Smokers. Only smokers. Oh, they want to quit smoking. They'll go there. I said, hold on, there's a building this big and that's all it's used for? This is so important. Okay, okay, yes. If, if they want to quit smoking, I think that's excellent. But a building of this size for only that purpose? And so we decided to implement a full system, social workers, psychologists, judges, public prosecutors, public defenders, everyone in the same building. And that's what we did. We inaugurated this building called the Kratod. We had seven ambulances available. If someone needed one of those emergencies that I mentioned, for instance, picking up a pregnant woman, someone who's lying on the street near death, having a psychotic break. And I'm never going to forget this day, Valfrida, when we inaugurated the building, because I don't know, I, I had given an interview the day before, and I said, now we're going to have a full, full service to give uh, all services to drug users. Why would I say that in a city like Sao Paulo? because we had scheduled the inauguration for 9 a.m. As I was arriving, I saw that there was a huge line. If you know Sao Paulo, we have Prado Street and José Paulino Street, the, the famous street where wedding dresses are sold. And we had the Loose Park. The line went around the corner with people who were seeking support some had brought their kids their parents their families others had made their own way there on their own saying i want to go there i want support when i saw that i said my god we're, we're not we're not equipped for this we had one single physician so it was just a result of my innocence and i said okay we can support 20 people a day. <laughs> no way. Can you imagine? I remember calling the governor immediately and I said, Dr. Geraldo, we are going to need a lot more, a much bigger service. The type of support we are offering here is like a war zone service. Since I have worked in a war zone before in East Timor, I know how that worked. So we put together we, we put together let me just show you here we have the attorneys and lawyers. Let me see if I have that service. Here is the, the hierarchy social workers, health care. People were always seen by a physician so that 
they could tell them what to do. Because in many cases, mothers would arrive saying, for God's sake, please admit him for a year. The mother was just tired. It wasn't a mother who no longer loved their child. No, they loved their child. But they said, I need, I need some rest. I, please admit them for a year. And I said, ma'am, I'm not the one who's going to say that. It's a physician who's going to say that. And they would say, he needs to be admitted. He needs to continue with a walk-in support. Or they can go into a therapy community. We had, and I'm not lying, some situation where we had uh, involuntary admissions. I'll never forget a man that came arrested because he had hit the father, which was a, a gentleman of 80 years old, and the sister called the police. So he called uh, the sister unnamed words, saying swear words to everybody, and the attorney, the judge, understood that he needed to be admitted so that happens and days later he said i want to be treated the experience i have with a few that i can count on my fingers of uh, involuntary admissions were in the sense to to address uh, an emergency an emergency situation but in the moment that this person was uh, back to some awareness they said i wanted to be treated this is the experience i had there was another case of a pregnant woman there was a travesty that came and then she said she said that she's gonna give birth and kill the baby and then i said oh god please go uh, take the ambulance and they did and she was saved this was done so this had to become a government program and it became the program the restart program in 2013 in which there was this goal always offer a full assistance humanized and specialized to the drug users i'd like to refer here that we always re work in a republican way with the state and the city of Sao Paulo, because there was sometimes that was the governor coming with the, the mayor, Adadi, and we always worked correctly, because our intention was to address with a solution with those problems that were posed, that I have to say. So this a network of uh, the Recomeso program, we had the Kratodi, we have a uh, the, 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 the hot phone hotline, which is Kira Comeso. Some people were already getting clean, but they didn't have how to where to go. So we had to find provisory housing. So as if at the Elvesh Street. what existed uh, so we had this housing with assistance there were people that are the programs were recommended the family this is something that i insist a lot we have to give attention to the families and why is that because if the family have the support maybe we will not be come to a point that the person will uh, be a user because the family had support. on the restart on the street, and I have to do my critics to that. We had something that was to go and talk to the people. And how did that happen? We would go to the drug user. We had the social assistance from my secretary and I would ask them, would you like to be uh, admitted? And they would say, no, they would say no. They would ask, would you want to be treated? And they would say, why? And why is that? Because that's not the question that should be asked. It's another one that I'm going to say later. The approach has to be a qualified approach. It's not just that, do you want to be treated? 
It cannot only be that. Maybe it has some results, but they might go there. But uh, that's not the main reason. The therapeutic community is so important. I have one slide only for that. And a hospital which was made in the countryside of Sao Paulo, which would receive people that needed longer treatments because they were very affected by the drug. With the therapeutic communities, they were crucial. But there was a situation in which was how the Secretary of Justice make a partnership with a therapeutic community throughout the state. And we did that with the Brazilian Federation of Therapeutic Communities. We started with 171 vacancies all around the state. And three years later, it was 1,335. I don't know the number today. I confess, because I'm not there anymore, but I've put here these pictures because it was a very emotional day where we have Padre Arudo, which was a big leader in this issue of uh, the therapeutic communities. They have a huge role to play because once they leave the admission phase, they need a period where it has a support, which is psychological, social, in its integrity in order to return to live uh, in society. The qualified logging off would be done by the reinsertion in, in their family, prevention to reuse um, therapeutic efficacy and in, uh, mental health indicators for the person to be locked off from all that treatment she would he or she would need to go through that process this is it's not enough to say oh you're good you, you can go obviously in this therapeutic communities these people might want to go they are not obligated to stay there not in hospital no way not even in therapeutic communities and not even using any equipment, they cannot be forced. The returns, they come back. Sometimes they return five, ten times. I remember a young man that said, I have gone back into drug for 25 times, but now it's been 10 years, I am clean. So these things happen. The monitoring housing which I understand is so important, is a project, there was a project from the Haddad, the mayor, open doors, included housing. Yes, it did. I believe that was a very good project. It should be in the menu because the menu has to be multifaceted, but not always the person has the possibility to take and take care of apartment on its own. So that's why it needs to be monitored. Have someone to do the cleaning, to do cook food, even do the bed at the first, at the beginning. Someone to say, now the psychologist will come here today, so you need to talk. So that's what we call monitored housing. It's very important to have not only one unit, but many. And then, who comes into this program? People in extreme vulnerability, unable to, to exercise their rights. This is one unity at the Ovetti Street, is an example of it. I left the Secretary of Justice and I went into the Secretary of Human Rights. The main project that the Secretary of Human Rights was the project that I did, I named, which is called Projeto Mães da Luz, Mothers of the Light Neighborhood, which was to take care of the families. That's something that we cannot avoid. We need to have a space specifically for the mother. So the name is Mothers of the Luz region, and it could also be the fathers, obviously, but is as a symbol for the care that it means a mother, maternity. Mother doesn't give up. 
and we call it Mother of Laos. This is a project that's over and it doesn't exist anymore, but I believe, Guilherme, that they, it should exist. Here. I'm almost done, okay, just a second. Here, we have an example of what I call motivational incentive is one of the most beautiful things I've seen for one person to leave this scenery of, uh, of open using. This project is from the, the city of Sao Paulo where physician, nurses and social assistants go talking to people that are very debilitated, trying to convince them to search for help. But then something came up. We're going to approach pregnant people. We're going to go into the Crackland area and approach pregnant women. We need a motivational aspect. We cannot only ask, do you want to, do you want to have treated treatment? We could ask, do you want to have your kid? If you do, we can help you. I, I get shivers when I remember this because there were so many situations where they said, yes, I do. They would leave that, they would go into an institution which take care of pregnant women, mothers, and in that pregnancy period, they would stay there, sleeping, eating, detoxing, with all the support. Amparo Maternal is the name of the, the association. And in that process, it would be interesting, in, we would understand who was the partner. Many of them didn't know who the partner was, the father was. Many of those situations were from rape, happened from rape. But they said, I have a mother, I have a father. So we try to rebuild those bonds. So they said, I want to be with my baby, especially after the when they give birth. Or maybe they would say, no, I don't want this baby. So we would lead them to other institutes and maybe um, eventually adoptions. This was important because uh, these uh, people said, oh, doctor, you know so much and you like so much this project. Can you help us? And they say, yes. And I said, yes. And we want to do um, a baby party for everyone. So at the time, I didn't know Valfredo, but I would call um, for help. And so we would look for ladies that had some better economic conditions to sponsor those programs. So who has helped? The OAB, the Lawyers Association, FIESP, the, and many other associations. So these projects happened and it was so beautiful. It was very important and it still exists. This is my last uh, slide, something that I believe, which is therapeutic justice. Let me bring the fish to my net, which is a uh, criminal justice, which is. This works, it has, it has been tested. It started in Santana, a neighborhood, which meant one person involved or with conflict with the law, with a crime, with a component related to drugs. Maybe it hit a car because it was, it had drunk, or maybe had committed crime because it was under drugs effect. This person goes to the justice and the prosecutor using one article of the law can do a deal. The person, so if it's a deal, the people have to agree. So saying that, okay, I'm not going to take you to a trial. 
if it's a minor crime, but you have to go into CAPS association or a self-help association. So the prosecutor will do a proposal of a therapeutic project for in which the person will have to agree with. I see nowadays another possibility. I spoke to the prosecutor yesterday about a different possibility. There's something new with the anti-crime law from 2019, which is the deal of non uh, prosecution that came with the anti-crime law. I keep thinking about the mobile phone thefts, which happens hundreds or millions of times in the region of the center of Sao Paulo. This person, if it's caught, would be taken to, to the church. Why not? Not Why? supposed to... Yes, go on. Why not propose to that person to join a medical treatment plan as part of the non-prosecution proposal? Well, it's a highly complex question. And you may say, Eliza, with all of that, crackland still is exactly the same, right? Well, we still have a long road ahead of us. I think Benedito Mariano said something very important, very first thing he said, we cannot continue to accept drug trafficking to act comfortably in that region. We cannot allow this. So, actually, I didn't mention public security once, just now. This is a public security matter. It's, it's over there. But here, with us, those who are going to care for the drug users, we need a menu at their disposal, which was always built historically, the CAPS, the hospitals, the therapeutic communities. This menu needs to be available for them. Housing, employment offers for after they are discharged from the hospital. I didn't include this, but they must also happen. Well, there are many different cross-sectional initiatives that must exist simultaneously and permanently and immediately, immediately. Because when someone says, okay, today I've decided I'm going to turn my life around. We can't tell them come back in three days. They, they need a position right then and there to be seen. It could be that that moment is when they turn their life around. I always say that this is a result of life experience. I'm no longer in any government position, so I walked from afar. I hope that the new administrations in the city and state of Sao Paulo will continue with all the good that was built. And I hope that we can build new policies and engage in new support actions for this very serious problem. Thank you very much. My dear brother, Guilherme Bolos, I know you really liked hearing us. And if there's anyone who can, uh, uh, who's, who's fit for this job, it's you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to greet Professor Luisa. I I was gesticulating while you were talking. I really enjoyed hearing you speak. I'd like to congratulate you personally for bringing this broad perspective on the question of crackland. I'd like to greet my friend, Valfredo Varde, who is one of the people who has been the uh, biggest supporter of public security in the country. And he has discussed with so many people, this is a topic that is crucial. Of course, the topic of crackland is not a, not only, not essentially a public security problem, but it, uh, it crosses the topic of public security. But we know that within 
the society's democracy until we start thinking about a well-founded public security program with beginning, middle, and end, and good structure. This debate starts falling into an extremist view, a simplistic view that thinks everything is solved uh, easily with guns, with mass imprisonment. We're seeing the Bukele pro, uh, model being spread around Latin America. So, Valfredo, it's great to see someone with a good head on their shoulders like you do talking about this. And so that's why I agreed immediately to come here and, uh, and join this discussion with you. Well, what I wanted to share with you about Crackland is that, firstly, we need to avoid two pitfalls that are often fallen into. I'm, I've been involved in public debate in Sao Paulo for many years now. I was candidate for mayor last time. I'm a pre-candidate for mayor again this time. And this is one of the major topics in the political discussion here in Sao Paulo. And we often have a fatalistic view and we think, oh, there's no solution. Crackland cannot be solved. Everyone has tried so many different things and it's still there. So there's almost this idea that anyone who presents any solution for Crackland is immediately discarded. People don't see it as legitimate. They think it's a natural part of uh, of the city but we cannot fall into that that trap it's very difficult to see these scenes of the use of crack and other drugs in sao paulo and not just sao paulo because the crack land is now multiple crack lands there are many cities in the country with crack land actually today we have over 150 locations where there's used smaller than crack land but within the city of Sao Paulo, it's not just the one crack land in Luz and Santa Efigenia. We're talking about many different small crack lands, including here in Brasilia and many other regions of the country. Now, the other trap is thinking that there is a silver bullet, that it's easy to solve crack land. And actually, that was the bet made by some political proposals within that uh, that discord, because that's what people want to hear. Oh, I'll solve it tomorrow. There was a candidate for the mayor of Sao Paulo who said that in one month he would solve the problem of crackland. And since that is utterly impossible to solve a problem this complex in such a short amount of time, this also reduces the credibility of this uh, uh, of, of attempts to solve this problem. So on the hand, it is possible. On the other hand, there's also no silver bullet. It's a complex issue and it needs to be dealt with as such. It's not a strictly speaking public security problem. It's a cross-sectional problem. What Benedito and Eloisa mentioned really presented many of these dimensions. And I would like here to speak very briefly about three of them that we have heard many people to propose, to create, and especially for the topic of crack land. And all of them in some way share the fact that we need to work on these three dimensions. The first is security because it is broadly and uh, absolutely proven, as Eliza mentioned, that the availability, the supply of drugs is a deciding factor in creating these scenes that we see of this use. Now think, what is the easiest time for you to get adherence from an addict to treatment? The easiest time is during their abstinence when they don't have access to the drug. You have better conditions to bring people to treatment. That's a topic of public health. I was fortunate to do my master's in psychiatry at the USD. I studied chemical addiction. And this is 
this is this is established if you can avoid or prevent or limit access to the drug then you will increase the size of the group of people who voluntarily seek treatment so when we talk about public security problems it's not a problem as has often been uh, attempted when you re rush in with shock troops throw in pepper spray and think that by scattering the the users you will find some level of solution to the problem this policy that was adopted recently only made things worse public security actions are intelligence actions, are investigative actions, because the drug is not created in crackland, it gets there. And it gets there, brought there, essentially by criminal organizations who have illegal labs, who have uh, warehouses where they store drugs near the crackland. There is a whole criminal organization that needs to be investigated and acted on and we need to work on these aspects with the civil police in an organized manner. The, the input for crack is the base paste used to create cocaine. And it's also not produced in Brazil. It comes in through the borders. And so you also need to tackle that problem, which is tackling organized crime and the narco traffickers and reducing the access by the residents of crackland to crack now this isn't something that is done only by the civil police city hall also has actions the municipal civil guard also needs to take action community policing close policing and integrated policing with the camera monitoring system Today, we have a problem in the city of Sao Paulo that actually makes it harder for you to get precise information and to identify the criminal actors, the criminal agents who do the drug trafficking in Crackland, is you have monitoring cameras, but you don't have an adequate information computer center. You have a lot of data being collected, and that data is not being turned into information. We need to work on centralizing that data and making adequate use of that data so that we can contribute, we can use that data to contribute to the civil police. This is an action that goes through all three levels of government. Yesterday, I was uh, giving a speech and I was saying that the first thing we need to do is call up Governor Tatsizio, who controls the civil police, the Minister of Justice, Lewandowski, who has authority over the federal police, to build an integrated solution for the topic of public security in Sao Paulo, which does include crackling. This needs to involve all three spheres. It's not just a local problem. Okay, so what is security like today at the location? Well, what we do is the city guard with logistic support from the military police, do what they call enveloping. They corral people into one single location, and then the civil police approaches those individuals. The problem is that's often done with heavy hand. So if you look case by case, oh, have do they have priors? Are they traffickers? Let's frisk them on the spot. Do they have any crack rocks? No, that type of approach needs to come after a prior intelligence work so that when you get there, you already know what you want to do. You're not supposed to look for a needle in a haystack. That's the problem we have today in the urban actions by the police in the crackland. The second question is obviously a question of mental health. And I would say that it is essentially a topic of mental health. And the individuals who are crack users and often have been for many years, as was shown here, it is very naive of us to think that those people are going to make their way to a CAPS, wait for their number to be called, schedule a consult, wait for their consult, 
to begin some kind of treatment, whether that is damage reduction, inpatient, anything. That's never going to happen. We need to work on active searching and qualified approaching, intelligent approaches, active searches and approaches. That's what we call a mobile CAPS initiative, which is putting together mobile clinics, get social workers and psychologists and psychiatrists working together in that region and handling those approaches. It's true that if you look at the raw numbers, voluntary adherence is not over 50%. But look at what the city of Bogotá did. This is important. Let's look at international experiences. Brazil was not the only one. Sao Paulo was not the only place that had or has this problem of massive drug use in uh, inside the city. The city of Lisbon had their own crack land where they use heroin, actually. And they solved that problem in a different way because their, their laws are different there. But let's look at Bogota. They had their own crack land. They still do, but it was vastly reduced. I had the chance to go there and talk to the public security secretary of the city at the PNUD event and with, with other individuals who were there. They did have mobile clinics. Adherence was not as high as it could be. So what did they do? Right next to the mobile clinic tent, they created another tent with dental care. They turned the corner because people wanted a dental treatment. They have a big difficulty to, uh, to have access to dentists, especially for crack users, this crack, rottens the teeth of their users so the people went there and so when they were there being treated with the things in their mouth the uh, assistants would approach these people and and with this approach over 80 percent took uh, mental assistance of admission in institution what i mean is that we don't have to create the will. There are experiences that have already happened, uh, that is happening, that have worked, and we have to look for, at them and implement. Experiences that happen, happened there in a program that the government of state uh, has conducted or the open arms programs conducted by the town hall. We have to look all those things that have worked, strengthen it. And what have worked in other places, we have to adopt it and build a program that is efficient without mental health professionals acting there. There is no solution. So we're talking here about mobile care, tents, a structure program acting in that region with a good approach and a proposal. And now for the last, the third and final point, this alone is not enough. We have a flow estimated by the first deep of Sao Paulo that does this follow up in the central region. It's about 1,200 people daily as a flow in the crackland area. We have there a high level of people that has already been admitted and they they were back. They have taken treatment, but they are back there smoking crack. So only acting to inhibit the traffic and have people trying to treat mentally these people will not solve the problem because nowadays we have deep social problems and people with a level of vulnerability in which, you know, crackland maybe is the only place they have. For instance, we have a high level of people that are left uh, the prisons in the crackland. The number is very high. Uh, Professor Eloisa might have follow up on this number. They are not able to. Because 
people are without family, unemployment, without housing. This person just goes to crackland and, and then it dips, it, it dives into the drug. If you don't have a program which works socially, moreover than the security problem and the health problem, we're going to not work. And the social intervention means housing, which is a topic that I have been working for over 20 years in the without uh, without housing movement. We have a chronic problem of housing, which goes well beyond uh, Craigland. People, homeless people in Sao Paulo, 53,000 people. One of the highest numbers in the world. A fifth of the population, the homeless population in Brazil. A fifth, sorry. And here we have to give immediate uh, solutions for the housing problem, because we're not gonna be able to build quickly uh, new houses to give to the people. So the first step is to have humanized spaces to receive these people. Look how crazy this is. We have 53,000 people homeless or homeless situation in Sao Paulo, and we, have not we have many vacancies to receive these people but they are not taken so we have um, a, a situation where people say no they don't want to solve this problem they want to stay in the street this is the problem that they have do you know why many people these people don't go to the housing spaces for a simple reason because the public policy ignores the reality of the people because most of these uh, refugees uh, places you cannot take the dog which is sometimes the only friend the person have and it's security because many times they don't have spaces for this their belongings because sometimes we recycling like taking things from the streets. And I have heard from um, someone in a homeless situation and they said, you know why I don't go to these places? Because I went, once I went there and I felt more humiliated than when I was on the street. Because the food is not good, because they split the family. So if we build spaces that are humanized and followed with uh, mental health professionals. We cannot just give a house to people say, okay, take care of yourself. If you do, if you do that, this person will most probably sell the house and go back to be a drug user. So these have to have a follow up, especially at the beginning with a presence of a social assistance and professionals of mental health. Now, humanized uh, places. And yes, these people will not stay there forever, but this is a, a, a way into the program. We, I saw this thing. One thing that works is when these people generate income, if you go to Crackland, giving them work, that will not just work. We have to start from the beginning. We go to the mobile cabs. You have to start reducing use. You have to take them to a place where they could take a shower. You can have basic housing. After that, you can put the perspective of work for them in different ways. You work for the government, like uh, the city, or they have different jobs within the municipality. Cleaning, for example, is a simple job that in general doesn't require qualification and that you can give them a salary 
A school for civil constructions and went into the city center and asked who wants to uh, training in this. The simple jobs, plumber, for example, and did a training course for them and deal and made a deal with bigger bigger constructor constructors to hire this person. In that specific experience, he were able to give um, work for for about 100 people who were homeless situation. Now, the town hall of Sao Paulo with a huge budget, with everyday um, public works can add this to its contract. Same, for example, 10% of the workforce has to come from people that have the, have done training and are willing to, to work. The salaries in the, the public construction is about three or 4,000 reais, which would be enough for these people to leave the traffic area and rebuild its life. So we have to think the whole cycle. That's what's going to allow a solution to the crackland. Will that be solved in a month? No. Will be able to end with the crackland in six months? No. But I'm sure that a policy which is consequent and that integrates all those aspects that I've mentioned that happens with planning, with good professionals, with follow up and revision of the the ratings and the numbers. I'm sure that in a few years, uh, this problem will be reduced a lot, especially in a city like Sao Paulo. And we could replicate these programs in other places in Brazil. We could make a pilot program, which would be an example to fight these scenes of use that's not specifically, that's not gonna work if we if attack those people that are there. Uh, we need to build um, a specific public security policy and treat people as humans, which is what they are. If we treat people as animals, they will behave as animals. If we do the basics, which is to have some empathy and to feel the pain of that person that's suffering, pain of that mother that has its son selling things from the house to buy a drug and don't know don't have where to go the pain of those deep in the problems and have only the drugs to alleviate the suffering if we humanize these people and do this uh, public policy which is Human, humanistic and efficient, a public policy planned look, with the experience of what have worked in the past. I am convinced that we can solve the problem of Crockland in Sao Paulo and the Crockland in Brazil. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you very much to my friend Valfredo. Muito bem. Eu, eu queria aproveitar esse momento. Very well. I'd like to take this opportunity because this is a convergence of the seminar and to invite uh, Senator Katia Abreu to come to the stage. E para abrir a câmera. 
and ask to open the screen so we can have the participation of my friend, Minister Tarso Genro, so we can do the closing. So firstly, I'm gonna uh, pass the word to Akacha Abreu to do her final considerations. And then ask the Minister Tarso Genro to close the work today. Actually, the work definitely. Thank you, Valfredo. Thank you for all of you that's been with us these last two days presentially and far away. It's a pleasure to have you here because the presence, even if silent, helps because of the reflection that each one of you will do with the amount of information that you have received here. And we'll only be able to find new ways after listening, doubting, believing, to later find public policies in which can solve the problems. I'd like to say, especially having the ex-governor, Tarso Genro, I'm very impressed with your performs in your physical performance. You look very well. Congratulations. And I would say you look good. Oh, yes, but my, my husband is jealous, but I can say that he's very elegant. Congratulations. Time did you well. Well, uh, may uh, we had a lot of knowledge here. And sometimes people said, oh, is Crackland the same with all the things that you've done? We have a problem in the country. With is, is the problem of discontinuity. The projects become personal. Not that Eloisa wanted them to be personal, but sometimes we believe that to be successful and to leave a legacy, I have to change hers and do mine. So this pattern in Brazil that makes everything go wrong everywhere in all areas is the project to call it mine. So we have a lot of things that we can call ours, my husband, my kids, but public policies are not ours. They are the public funds. They're I don't like this word because when we say public, it sounds like there's no owner. No, this money belongs to the Brazilian people. I'm not a candidate like Bolos. I don't have any uh, electoral policies, but I, I think it, it sounds very good. I love saying this. And the, the people's money needs to be valued. It needs to be inspected and looked after. And people who put hands on that money with evil intent need to be punished, not just when they steal funds, but when they change public policies that are working because of hubris, because of political reasons. I love seeing keeping things that are working, right? Because inventing something takes so much work. If something is working out, why am I going to rack my brain trying to create something else? It's vanity, it's pride. It's people who are really really uh stingy i don't i don't want to name any names but everything i've seen over these past couple of days and i've been hearing over the past few months to study for our seminar has shown me i'm i'm so impressed with how simple the solutions are i'm an optimist by nature but i love simple solutions so when you hear all of these sessions, of course, I couldn't hear all of them, but I will later. Everyone touches on a strong focus point. The unity of police forces, the unity of databases. This is so, so late. And this is, there's nothing worse than refusing to open up your data refusing to combine your data. So now when I heard that the munition data are located in a specific place and the owner of the store who, who sells the weapons has access, but the police officers do not, that's, a, that, that's absurd. They open the stores, they're sold and inspected. 
by the army and the police officers, the poor guys, they can't inspect that data. This all needs to change. So when I see how simple this can be, we have unified data systems. It's open to every Brazilian citizen. So why is it that in public security, all of this data is individualized and pigeonholed and they are they're secreted away in its truth, a secret database? So I will mention two things that are so huge, so important in fighting crime and so easy to do. All that we need is the desire by the public servants. If I have the pen in my hand to make a decision and I fail to do something that will fight crime and corruption, then I'm, I must be complicit. I must be trying to protect them. Otherwise, I would want to do something to improve. Now, I must mention I was trained as a psychologist, but above all, I'm a woman, a mother, a grandmother. And now in November, I will be a great grandmother. So I don't know if you'll be impressed, but I'm going to be a great grandmother. I'm impressed. Now it's my turn to do what you did for Tasto. You're looking good, Katya. I'm glad someone mentioned. Folks, being a grandmother and a grandmother, it's not about age, it's about skill, okay? All right. I must also mention the social aspect. Sometimes people who are more radical on the right or the left, they want to pretend they're saints, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is that social issues must be moved forward by the right, by the left, by the center, because it is a critical issue. You're going to cut evil by the root if you take care of people in early childhood. If they're hungry, thirsty, homeless, if they don't have medicine, they can't go to school, they don't have daycare. The most likely thing is for these people, what, to become criminals? No, to become vulnerable to crime. It's very different. No one is targeted to die, and no one is targeted to become a criminal, but they do become vulnerable. We need to separate vulnerability from criminal who turn crime into business to make money. It is totally different. There's nothing about society or social work. For those, for career criminals, we need prison time, police. But for the vulnerable individuals, we need public policies because if they're vulnerable, it's because the Brazilian state has failed them. We have failed them. We failed to give them opportunities. We didn't give them education or quality education. We need quotas so that they can join public universities because the public school wasn't good enough. I voted in favor of quotas, but I was embarrassed to do it because what we should do is require schools to be good so that we don't need quotas. But if the schools are not good, then we need quotas for black people, for kids who went to public school and couldn't get into a college, a good college, because they can't compete with kids who went to private school. This is too powerful for the state, for the public power to assume this responsibility. So turning Brazilian prison into a home office of criminals paid for by Brazilian criminals, that's, that's the end. The criminal is sitting in his home office in prison administering and managing crime. And I'm sure there's another department where they enlist youth. If the military service enlists youth, so do the criminals. If they agree, then they will join organized crime. And if they disagree, then they get killed. And there's another department that enlists youth who are not yet in prison, but they could be offering wages for someone who doesn't have a hundred reels to buy some food. This is a type of vulnerability I want to defend, to protect. We don't want vindictive justice, monstrous justice that destroys, accuses the poor, the youth, 
the unemployed, if they're unemployed, it's because we, the Brazilian state, we're not able to give them jobs or school. But what we can do is either accept that half of the youth who should be in high school, what does that mean? Where they're on track to be lost, to have their lives lost. They're going to be vulnerable and they may be enlisted by the organized crime, by poverty, by disbelief, by the lack of optimism. That's what life is like. My grandma, my mom, I, we're all poor. So that's what life is. Sorry, sometimes I get a little emotional. I want to give people a chance. Someone said yesterday that of prisoners, 60% of them are members of some faction. And 40% of them are not members of any faction. So what can we do with those 40%? And sometimes there are members of factions that want to be freed. Is there a public policy for them? Or are we going to make the organized crime happy? I'm sure the criminal home office is very thrilled with the decision to treat uh, pos simple possession as drug dealing. Oh, that's great. We're going to have more soldiers at our disposal. No, we need to reflect on that. Social work is the most important opportunity. And I'll conclude by saying that I am a warrior. Senator Alencar from Bahia says that I am the Yansan, one of the Orishas of Tocantins. And some people say she's a warrior, but I don't know. I think I'm a survivor. When I became a widower, a widow, pardon, everything I tried, all the predictions, everything, everything went wrong. I won't waste your time. I'm a warrior. I'm a fighter. I refuse to accept criminals to win. If I die, then one thing that I want to see before I die is for organized crime to collapse. Otherwise, I'm going to make my voice heard, even from the afterlife. We will become richer, and we already are richer, and we have so many more people. How can organized crime beat us? How much tax does the government collect? We have so much more than the crime, than the factions. We are so much more powerful than them. And they don't, are, they're not uh, up to our level. I don't even care what they're called, the Red Command, the Purple Command, whatever. We went to university, we studied, we're specialists. We work hard. Brazilian people, they work hard. And are we going to let those crooks, those criminals, those vagabonds win, we refuse. We are going to beat organized crime. Thank you. Minister Tarso Genro, please, you are the keynote speaker. You're, you have the last word, and it could be no different. Your wisdom is boundless, and we would love to hear you and your thoughts on our future adventures. Thank you, Valfrido, for the chance to speak. Valfrido is a great political figure in our country. You have such skill at bringing people together and promoting such great dialogue like the kind we're seeing here at this seminar, at this amazing event with international consequences and reflection. I would like to greet Senator Katia Abreu, who really is a fighter. He is a, a, a landmark of Brazilian politics. And I'm honored to share this time with your generous words about me. I think Guilherme Bolos is still here, my dear friend. I would like to give you a warm hug. We share a number of ideas and understanding, political and otherwise, and we are, are, are very well aligned, very close friends. Valfredo, this event is, I think, going to be 
a watershed moment for a long time in this country about public security. I haven't seen all the talk or all the the uh, the speakers like Senator Kachebro, but I did see some some of the most important ones, and I'd like to mention a few of them. And it was a very gentle touch that you had in order to keep this this seminar fit for uh, bipartisan discussion. So like our friend Katia Abreu, I want to talk about the polarization that occurred and I want to perhaps uh, explain them a bit. I haven't seen any members of the government here in this debate mentioning other than initially our Minister of Justice, our brilliant Minister of Justice, some important topics, but I didn't see any current members of the current administration say anything other than obvious comments and platitudes about organized crime, organized crime that is destroying our state and is present in every institution. And this is what I want to do. I want a to to reflect on the flows through which organized crime and crime in general organizes and recomposes, strengthens and structures itself are different from the original flows of our classical industrial society. In classical industrial society, which is not where we live today. Today, we live in a digital society. It does still have a traditional backbone, but all of the values, the morals and political and intellectual and financial values are flows that are different from the ones that occurred during classical industrial society. At the time, there was a simple exchange between the poor zones where the more excluded people lived and formal society, which occurred through direct communication, internalized communication that dealt with that region, that city, that country. It's a form of existence that established a connection with formal society that dumped its criminals that they enlisted and took them to work in the cities, whether through simple thefts or otherwise. So the flows nowadays are not the most important. And therefore, public security needs to be structured. Only considering this relation will be a uh, public security will be uh, public security that will be not work. So how does this exchange happen nowadays? It happens through the communicational flows, the new ones in a society that's of information, information technology, digital information, which happens from country to country, the value, financial values, moral values, political informations, information regarding organizations that create an integrated criminality globally. And as my colleague Katia Abreu and, and Bolos to, told, that boy that goes into the crack, that boy that delivers some cocaine to places of the middle class or middle high classes that needs those stimulus for those that stimulus or for its leisure, this boy is the last link on a global chain. What? Because this organized crime is in the favelas, in the suburbs. It's integrated in the criminal, cr criminology flow which is organized in a way that's inseparable. For example, 
the issue of information. How does it, how is it processed? In Brazil, recently, we've had one of the worst security incident that happened this century, which was an attempt of coup, the entering of the Palace of Justice and the executive, the, the Congress, and the destruction of big part of uh, the patrimony of our country, which is key for our country, for our politics, which was very important for the democr democratization process of the country. This, fortunately, was avoided, avoided a civil war, but also did concessions from each side that determined the survival of a pretension, anarch, anarchic coup. This is related to what happened um, because of uh, public security that's not very well established, uh, which was happened in an organized way from the outside to the inside, together with the international flow of information from outside of the state to inside of the state through organized crime together with public um, political parties that still survive in the country nowadays. And they were surely attempted it again, because nowadays these main bosses are still not identified. How, is, how are we gonna come out of this? We need to think public security on our everyday lives from a chain of political articulations through institutions, civil and military, that will bring you uh, an idea of what policies should we establish in each one of these layers. For example, the security over our continent, a continent democratic continental security that we have to establish, establish through a military deal with the democratic countries in Latin America, or at least in South America, to articulate relations which are co collaborative on the borders, on the combat of uh, tr uh, and weapon trafficking, the surveillance, the border of each country on the legal occupation that is done in every country on top of the economic interests of people that are there outside and are assaulting, doing these assaults. So to reduce this, uh, the, the revolutionary movement in the past, when we had this democratic movement to fight dictatorship, they have to be done again. A continental deal with the countries that have adopted a democratic regime and act according to it. So we need this plan because without this plan, it's impossible to control the region. And it's possible to have efficient program inside this territory because there's no more separation between the external and the internal. Now let's talk about the second level, the security of the state. What does that mean? The security of the democratic country with uh, democratic ideas and has a constitution as ours that orientates the country is we need to organize a state which is capable, as the doctrine, international doctrine says, a doctrine which makes any danger go away. So we have to have institutions. We have to have institutions that put away the dangers of a democratic living. So this has to do with the topic of climate changes, that had a deep impact here in my state, uh, Rio Grande do Sul, in the south of Brazil. 
which you all have been following, but also a build Intel um, offices that are able to protect the Brazilian institutions. The Supreme Court, the Congress, a state organized as a parliament, a state organized as the police forces. This is a security of state, it's to protect the institutions. And then we go into a third level from top, bottom or bottom up. It's indifferent because all of them are part of the totality. So we talk about national security. And what does that mean? What, what is it nowadays? National security is the state to be capable and organized to fight threats for um, territorial sovereignty, being through the nar narco narcotic wars to neutralize groups that are wanting to take some territory and do illegal actions, mining, illegal commerces through this flow of uh, international finances that end up in those islands with its uh, banking structures that do the communication through the legal and illegal flow of money that nowadays it's part of a a complex banking system, but it exists to make this happen. So we need uh, uh, deals of reciprocity that uh, allow um, international surveillance to. And then we go into another territory, public security. Let's call it public security, the security of everyday life, of all citizens. How? How can we do it? I'm aware that exists a metaphysical separation that is done for by some elaborators of politics uh, that understand the problem of public security happens because of poverty. If that was true, we would have uh, a public insecurity in Brazil, which would be absolutely impossible to be solved. Because in a country that still have an index of poverty as ours, obviously it, it provides conditions for the people to go beyond the frontiers of illegality. But this is an offense to those that work, the workers. It's an offense to the miserable people that will not be part of criminality and go there they are there on the streets picking up what we call clean garbage when they were taking, so they could actually organize their life and their survival. So these are factors that transcend the issue of poverty. The stimulus of the mis uh, poverty is seen in different layers of uh, the population. And then to project a program of public security, which is adequate and is recognized by two parts. Those who suffer, those issues are related to security and the policy forces on the other side. When we governed, when we govern, we know well that there's a specific limit, a human limit between the policy man and the citizen that put us between life and death. And therefore, and then I'm also support fearlessly, uh, fearlessly the body camera in the, in the uniform of the officers. Because those officers, they sacrifice their life to protect citizens and also give answers to those people who believe that the policy officers are very violent in their act actions. This is just one example of problems in the public security. The, the program should be preventive. It should be with programmed actions, has to establish 
vicinity relationship through the present the permanent permanent presence of the police forces and also it has to in the prisons they have to separate the older criminals to young ones they have to be separated they have to be like we do in our schools this separation is what could reduce the 60 percent of reincidence that young people when they leave prisons do they they go back to crime because of the lack of opportunities so i when i was in office i did a program of security and citizenship which was not 100 percent is um established but reduced criminality where we were working with the people and women the mothers in this uh, uh more po poverty regions which would establish uh, protection to their kids and many other programs that happened in the countries this program is expired it has to be remade like restructured because this new reality that we face it links the small crimes with the global crimes through this financial flows this um, organizational organizational flows that are international which threatens the state the people of each citizen thank you very much sorry if it was longer than i expected but i'd like to thank you very much for your attention congratulations for the density of your rationale and for how precise you did to to look at the, the problems and and bring solutions thanks for the brilliance of your rationale so we finish the seminary of sec public security or human rights and democracy thank you very much for all of you that are still here that's wonderful thank you so much Tarso, thank you so much big hug Thank you.